Please welcome to the stage Executive Director of the Linux Foundation, Jim Zemlin. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our annual member summit. This is my favorite event. Uh, Chris Wright, the CTO of Red Hat, uh, likes to describe this event as uh, the hallway track, where the entire event is the hallway track. Uh, it, this is one of the funnest crowds to speak in front of, because I feel like so many of you I've known, you know, I'm coming up on my 20th anniversary at the Linux Foundation, and so many of you I've known for more than a decade. Uh, and we've worked together uh, to accomplish so many uh, amazing things. Uh, before I get started, I want to make sure I thank our sponsors, uh, AWS and uh, OpenSearch. Uh, I want to also thank our gold sponsors, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation uh, and Google. Uh, we can't do these events without our sponsors, and we really appreciate it. Um, you know, like I said, it, 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 this is my favorite event. I feel like in this crowd, you know, we can be uh, intimate with each other in talking about, you know, things where we may disagree. Uh, imagine in open source that we disagree about certain <laughs> things, uh, but we can also be comrades and uh, you know be uh, open with each other in such a meaningful way and continue to grow our communities and build more consensus, which is of course the whole point of everything we do. So now let's talk about some things that we all work together on, things that unite us, right? And uh, one of the fun things that, uh, about this event is that we get to kind of talk about the art and science and craft of open source, right? This is the uh, PhD level open source crowd here at the Linux Foundation um, Member Summit. And today I thought I would talk a little bit about what foundations themselves, organizations like the Linux Foundation and many other uh, open source foundations do. I'd like to talk about uh, what we do, why we do it, and how we do it. How do we you know, create the kind of success that we see in open source? Why do we even bother doing it? And I often get asked, like, how does an organization like the Linux Foundation or how do open source uh, projects define success? And I'd like to offer my thoughts on that. I think the biggest definition of success at the end of the day is impact. How many lives did you impact? How many markets did you change? How many uh, things did you improve in the world? After all, that's why we're all doing what we're doing. Of course, we're collectively working together to create open source code, to build communities. But at the end of the day, all of that work has to amount to something. And impact is what it's all about. You know, 20 years ago, I would have never in my wildest dreams when I started this job thought that Linux would be the most widely used and important software in the history of computing. And I bet you if you asked Linus Torvalds in a moment of honesty 30 years ago, he probably wouldn't have said the same thing either, would have thought the same thing as well. He just never would have predicted it. But the impact has really been tremendous. It has, you know, led to incredible innovation. And that's the kind of thing I think we all want to continue to achieve in our collective work. And at the Linux Foundation, we definitely want to have impact. But before we talk about impact, we have to ask about, like, what exactly is it that we do? Recently, there's been news uh, about open source license changes, and our foundation's a good thing, and is open source going to change? And I can you know, uh, give you all a sigh of relief, and that open source will continue. Uh, and that foundations will continue to do good work. I'm not worried about that, but I do think it's important to uh, be clear about what foundations actually do. And for those of you who were here last year, I'm gonna brush off uh, my old meme. Uh, it's you know, sort of a early 2000s internet meme to sort of describe what uh, foundations actually do. Um, so my friends all think that my job at a foundation is going around to exotic locations, giving keynotes, uh, having a wonderful time, and they're unclear on what, actually my wife isn't even clear quite on what I do. <laughs> um, but that's what people think foundations do. Well, it's all a bunch of marketing and it's all a bunch of stuff that, you know, it's, uh, they're all having fun at these events. 
Uh, my mom thinks that I'm practically saving the world and that it's so lovely. And you know what? Even if I had a totally different job, she'd probably think the same thing. Uh, I think society still thinks that we're all a bunch of hippies giving stuff away uh, for free. Uh, nothing wrong with that, right? Especially we're here in California. Um, Developers obviously think uh, this is what we're doing. Tonight I'll be out in the, the lobby area with my cigars and $100 bills for those of you who care to join me. Uh, this is what I think I do. I think I'm just so great at what I do. Uh, I have to have uh, some kind of uh, solace in that. Uh, but this is what foundations actually do. Uh, I love to use this metaphor. We're kind of the janitors of open source. And of course, when you're the janitor, the bathroom is never quite clean enough. Well, what open source organizations like the Linux Foundation do, or the Eclipse Foundation, or the Apache Software Foundation, is all the stuff around the core of open source, which is to create these wonderful projects, this, um, these amazing innovation engines, uh, that have to be done. Somebody has to organize the event. I think we have a pretty darn good event team. Somebody has to promote the project in order to get more developers to come. Somebody has to manage the IT infrastructure and all of the build environments and so forth. Someone has to underwrite all of that. Someone has to help teach people about how to use the technology and come into the community quickly. Someone has to manage all of the intellectual property that's used to govern these. You know, intellectual property is at the core of what we do, whether it's a trademark or a copyright or patent. Somebody has to do this work. To be clear, this is what we do. What we don't do is we're not actually an engineering organization. Uh, the, the Linux Foundation only employs a, a, a very small number of engineers. Uh, one of them is very cantankerous and doesn't listen to anything that I say. <laughs> I think we know who I'm talking about. But what the Linux Foundation is trying to achieve is to be a new type of innovation organization, whether it's doing all the hard work that isn't code related for an open source project or to develop a global standard or to create uh, data sharing so that artificial intelligence uh, models can consume large data sets in a many to many sharing way. This is the stuff we do. And you know, the Linux Foundation is only home to about a thousand kind of core open source projects. And when I tell people that they're like, aren't there like eight gajillion open source projects on GitHub, that like a thousand, that seems really, really small, right? And it's sort of counterintuitive. But what a foundation really does is focuses in on those really important projects that we all collectively depend on. And there actually is a very long tail of open source, and that's not to diminish the long tail, but it's to point out that projects like Linux and Kubernetes and PyTorch are just critical to all of us collectively, and that's why even more you need to create sustainable ecosystems around these, because people will indeed, and they have for 30 years, count on this technology for a long period of time. And this is what those ecosystems look like. I want to remind us, you've, many of you have seen this, and I want to keep reminding you, what we're, the, the Linux Foundation is almost like a weird reverse VC. Uh, where instead of looking for product market fit, we're looking for project market fit. You know, is this open source project something that can move the needle on society? Is it good technology that can be used widely for really important tasks? Can we get the financial underwriting? Can we get industry and society to collectively invest? If so, that project becomes products like a cloud service or internet search or a mobile handset or an embedded system. And those products create value in the form of profits or in benefit to society. And when companies and society create value, they then reinvest, largely not in the form of investing in the Linux Foundation, although I do ask all the time for people to invest in the ELF. The big investment in open source is in engineers who find bugs to improve code and then contribute back to that project, which begets better products, which begets more value, which begets better projects, and that's the virtuous cycle. And here's all the stuff 
that you have to do to support that virtuous cycle of development. It's just a large set of things. At the Linux Foundation, we have over 350 employees who support all of these endeavors across these critical projects. And one of the fun ways I like to think about the Linux Foundation in terms of facilitating this work is just how leveraged of an engineering effort it actually is. This is one of my favorite statistics, $26 billion. We track the developers who work in our communities uh, every day. It's roughly about 600,000 on any given day. And so as an experiment, I took the average pay for a developer from the highest in the United States to the lowest in parts of West Africa and came up with about a $43,000 a year average software developer uh, uh, cost across the globe. And if you multiply that times the number of developers in our community, it's, it would equal a $26 billion payroll. And uh, one of our speakers today is from Microsoft, so he can correct me if I'm wrong on this, Mark. It's, uh, Microsoft's R&D payroll, I think this is from their last year's annual report, was $24 billion, Microsoft being the largest software company in the world. But if you compare it to the Linux Foundation, we're giving Microsoft a pretty good uh, run for the money uh, in this leveraged uh, outcome. And so that's what we do at the Linux Foundation. And we have all kinds of metrics for the what. Right? Are we growing developers? Are we adding members? You know, last year we trained cumulatively three million people. Uh, we, the, our event team ran 256 events with uh, uh, 120,000 attendees across uh, over 70 countries. Uh, just an amazing amount of work. But the most important thing is why. Why we do it, and that comes back to this impact. And today, it's, uh, it's incredibly hard for, for even me, who's been at it for 20 years, to even keep track of all the tremendous impact that happens across all of these amazing open source projects. And so I'm gonna show you some busy slides, and I'm just gonna pick a few things out of each to give you a sample of the kind of impact we're seeing at the Linux Foundation uh, this year. And what I would encourage you to do is pick your favorite open source project or open source organization and go find these same stories about impact and share them with other people and remind folks how important the work that we all do is every day. You know, in uh, edge computing, in open source advocacy, in cloud computing, uh, this year the Linux Foundation did a ton of work. Uh, our team, collaboratively with many of you in the room, uh, worked to provide a clear voice on the Cyber Resilience Act in the EU that can have a real negative impact on open source, to help work with regulators there to correct well-intentioned but misguided legislation uh, related to open source. Our organization worked collectively with our community to defend against US PTO rule changes that could negatively impact open source collaboration. Like I said, we passed over three million course enrollments, training a new generation of developers on open source technology. And while Linux may not be the shiny new thing, it just continues to be the underlying platform for the majority of the world's computing systems. In other areas, AT&T is now seeing a 40% reduction in their operating expenses through virtualizing their infrastructure and using our open network automation platform to orchestrate this software-defined modern network. 40% reduction in OPEX, that is incredible. Kubernetes, it goes without saying, has fundamentally changed the way new cloud applications are built and maintained. New projects like CNCF's Backstage are resulting in massive statements. I, I love that we talked to the folks at Toyota. Toyota, just one company, is saving $5 million a year due to a better developer experience using Backstage. I mean, that is real impact. Think about that, what you could do with that extra $5 million. In AI, one of our projects, PyTorch, is the backbone of machine learning and large language models. We're home to numerous critical standards and software building blocks that are used to create those 
large language models, those foundation models like ChatGPT that we're all hearing about that will fundamentally change our lives. But those all require these open source building blocks, these open data sets to actually make that happen. The Open Source Security Foundation has, after years, finally gotten real momentum with SigStore to have actual package signing in the distribution of the software we all collectively depend on. And from hearing aids to Chromebooks to small embedded systems, the Zephyr Real-Time Operating System Project is not only helping to create these devices, but is extending battery life in meaningful ways so that that hearing aid can last longer, so that that wearable that can monitor your health can last longer. These are all incredible impacts, and I could go on and on and on. In our energy project, a Dutch grid operator is performing power system analysis 10 to 100 times faster with our open source project, the power grid model. RTE, the French power distribution company, the, the national energy provider for France, is using an open source project's fled, fledged power to reduce their operating costs by 50%. This is real impact. This is why we work on the stuff we do. It is directly helping with climate change. It is amazing to see this kind of work. And it's not just market impact or society impact. One of my favorite things that foundations do is provide personal impact. You know, I, I love going to our events and talking to developers and talking to folks, young folks who come to our events. And you know, we've offered every year millions of dollars in funding to help people from underrepresented community, to help people who have uh, lesser means to come to our events. And that has resulted in real job opportunities that are life changing. I'll never forget being in Shanghai one time, and I was at a meeting. There was a, a woman in the back uh, a room of the, the, the back end of the meeting and ran up to me afterwards and said, Jim, 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 I, I just, I, I got to talk to you. I'm like, I kind of freaked out a little bit. I'm like, what is it? She's like, I just, you changed my life. This woman was from Brazil, had gotten a travel uh, sponsorship to come to one of our events, met up with Tencent at the event, got a job, moved to Shanghai completely life-altering experience. And we have those over and over and over again at the foundation. It's one of the funnest things about the job. And you are all a part of that story. I mean, think about how many of you have talked to folks who've been at our events and helped them get their career started and change their lives in a meaningful way. I mean, that's just, that's why we work. We're working on diversity and having real impact there as well. $1.6 million in community travel funding just this year alone to bring people from diverse communities into our world. And we get to hear about the impact of that, and we know that diverse communities are better communities. The Linux Foundation itself walks our talk. We have a diverse staff at every layer of the organization, from the board to the management team to our staff in and of itself. And I think these are the important things. That's why we do what we do. And the last thing, though, that I want to leave you all with is a little Linux Foundation insider secret, which is how we do it. This is the thing I don't actually talk all that much about, right? People are like, oh, we know the Linux Foundation, and they're doing all this stuff, and they're having this impact. But they're like, what's the secret? Why has the Linux Foundation or other organizations like ours been able to do that? How? And I want to share uh, the internal, this is for new employees at the Linux Foundation, all Linux Foundation employees will recognize this from our collective all hands, the, the culture and training how to for working at the Linux Foundation and for working in open source communities. I think this doesn't just apply to being an employee at the Linux Foundation. I think this applies to definitely working with open source communities and large uh, collective uh, efforts. Probably also applies to life, right? They're not that complex, but I think uh, they're sage and wise. 
And, and, and the catchphrase we use is helpful, hopeful, and humble. You know, at the core, to be the janitor, you have to want to help people. You have to want to make things better, right? To do all that work to enable the brilliant minds who create this code, you have to have a true desire for the in the best in people. Anticipate the needs of others, of developers, of sponsors who are contributing to these communities. You have to be able to you know, add value by listening, validating, solving problems in the context of community members' needs. That may be different than the answer you're thinking immediately, but if you're striving to be helpful, you'll always get better outcomes doing all of that hard work that needs to be done to support these collective efforts. And of course, you cannot also do this effort without being optimistic and uh, hopeful. You know, optimi optimism is a sign of strength and stability. And uh, if I had a nickel for every criticism of the Linux Foundation or myself personally, it's just, it happens in, you know, the, 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 the open source way, you know, has, is generally, a way of critique, right? We work on source code together, we critique that source code. Sometimes that criticism can get pretty loud and pretty tough to deal with. And if you're hopeful that even though things are hard, that you know that there will be a better outcome in the end, that our best days are ahead of us, then you can iteratively solve problems with developers and community members in consideration of better outcomes. But I think the last H in the helpful, hopeful, humble culture at the Linux Foundation is the most important one, which is just humility, right? Humility to know that you don't have to be the center of attention to help have big impact. That you don't need to uh, be the person who gets all the credit, that you succeed when your community succeeds. Remember, the Linux Foundation, our job, the job of most foundation, depends on people getting work done, none of whom work for us. If we can't lead through influence, we can't do our jobs. And leading through influence, leading from behind, is an act of humility, of constant learning, of recognizing there are just different ways to solve problems than you might know about. And if you have that sense of humility, that's what really is the secret to the success of working at an organization like the Linux Foundation or in the open source community in general. And that's really where I wanna leave you all with, is how important those things are. I think we all understand what we do. It's important, we're not a developer organization. We do all that hard stuff around it in order to make that brilliant development work happen. We do it in order to have impact. And the way we do it is by being helpful, being optimistic, but most importantly, humble. And you know, recently, I have been humbled. You know, uh, for those of you, you can't quite see it, but I recently faced a health challenge myself. I've got a big scar on my face. I was diagnosed with a form of skin cancer that needed immediate care. Thankfully, I, I underwent surgery, and just to get ahead of all the questions, when you see me up close and you see the scar, it was a complete success, no cancer. Uh, but it has been a reminder of the fragility of life especially in these incredibly unpredictable times. You know, uh, I, I can't help but think of individuals around the world who face their own battles. Many without the healthcare resources that I've been fortunate enough to access or a circle of support around them. You know, their struggles are so much in contrast to my own situation I'm just grateful for the medical attention I've received, the friends and family who've helped me, and all of your support. It's a privilege I don't take lightly, uh, and it's just reinforced humility and my empathy and desire to support other people. You know, I, I, I'm reminded of the words of Helen Keller. Alone, we can do so little. Together, we can do so much. 
whether it's facing a challenge in health, personal turmoil, or the immediate pain affecting us in the world and in the Middle East today. It is our togetherness, our collective empathy, our unwavering support to one another that help us navigate through these difficult times. At the Linux Foundation, we are so lucky, and I speak on behalf of our entire staff, that that is essentially our full-time job. We get to build communities. We get to bring people together. And so that's what I want to leave you all with today. Let's be there for each other in all the ways that matter. Thank you. And with that, uh, I am going to introduce uh, our first talk of the day. Um, this talk is incredibly timely. It's on the topic that everybody wants to talk about these, AI and the future of AI in open source developer. Um, fun fact, two of our speakers are close friends and have been uh, married for quite some time. I think you'll recognize who they are. Uh, but I'm going to let our moderator handle the introductions for everyone. So uh, please welcome Erica Brescia, John O'Bacon, and Bayan Lu. All right. Good to see everybody and so many familiar faces. Thanks for being here today. And Thanks to both of you for making the trek down. Um, so my name's Erica Brescia. Uh, I started life as a founder in the open source world, then went on to be COO of GitHub. Now I've moved over what, uh, to what some call the dark side. I'm a venture capitalist, uh, but also proudly served on the board of the Linux Foundation for about eight years. Um, obviously, as an investor and just uh, open source citizen, I think, AI and the future of open source is something very top of mind for me. So really look forward to diving into what I think will be the start of hopefully an ongoing, really interesting conversation. Um, before we dig into that, I'll let you two introduce yourselves. Um, John, we all know you have outstandingly good taste in spouses. So we'll start with that. Uh, <laughs> Haven't met my wife yeah, yet? <laughs> most, most important. Um, yeah, tell everybody a little bit about what yeah. you do. So, I, hey everyone, I'm Jono. Um, I founded an accelerator called the Community Leadership Core, where we help companies who've invested in building communities in DevRel to get just quarterly results with growth and engagement. We provide coaching and, uh, and training and all kinds of good stuff. So, cool. All right. Uh, I'm Bjorn, CTO co-founder of a company called Sourcegraph. Uh, we build developer tools, so we're makers of uh, Sourcegraph, the code search engine, uh, as well as Cody, uh, an open source AI coding assistant that makes use of the code search engine to better write code and answer questions about your specific code base. So, you know, obviously open source very much all about code to kick us off. Um, what are some of the most interesting or surprising learnings you've had since releasing Cody into the wild? Yeah, so um, for background, Cody uh, is uh, our open source AI coding assistant. It's something that we started building um, maybe about a, a year ago, uh, actually. Like, it was about a month before ChatGPT came out. Um, and uh, we, we built it, we kind of got it out in the marketplace, and it's, it's similar to a lot of the other AI coding assistants that people have used. We do kind of like inline autocompletion. There's also a chat-based interface. Uh, and there's this kind of like a set of commands that does things like generate tests, uh, write documentation, things like that. It's so, better though, right? Uh, yeah, so we, <laughs> <laughs> we, we like to think so. Uh, we think the main point of differentiation is that it's, it has the context of your code base. So it's able to use code search and code navigation, things that we spent the past 10 years kind of building at Sourcegraph for human developers. Uh, now we're handing that to the AI, and it turns out that helps a lot with the quality of the code generation. Um, but in terms of surprising use cases, uh, I think it's been uh, just like surprises around every corner, um, both good and bad, actually. So I'll, I'll give maybe like one good and, and one bad surprise. Uh, a good surprise has been um, just everywhere that people are finding use cases for it in the kind of like inner loop of the dev cycle. So when we first started out, we thought the main use case would be for like writing code, right? Because the first 
uh, kind of version of Code AI that was popular was kind of this like inline autocomplete tool. Um, we've, we've found that a, a lot of what people are using Cody for is actually not just the writing code, but actually understanding what's going on in the code. It turns out like AI, uh, very good at translating from one language to another, including from programming languages to human language. It's actually a very good explainer of hairy code or difficult technical concepts if you're new to uh, an area of the code base. And so that's been kind of a delightful surprise. It's like, hey, this is not just good for uh, AI-generated uh, code. Uh, it, it's actually useful for human developers who want to understand uh, what code is being written, regardless of whether it's written by a human or an AI. Uh, a bad surprise has been um, the initial version of Kodi who kind of represented this thing as kind of like a, you know, a, a chat-like uh, quasi-sentient uh, persona. And as a result, a lot of people assume that you could sort of ask questions of it as you much would a, a human. So there are a bunch of like quote unquote softball questions that people would ask of the coding assistant that were actually quite difficult for it to answer. So something like, hey, how many uh, like C files are in this code base? It's something that like a human could answer very easily with a simple you know, uh, one line bash command. Uh, it turns out the way that this thing works, we're essentially just taking the user question, doing a bunch of code searches, fetching in code snippets, and then asking the language model to come up with an answer. And so it's actually very bad at counting files. So just make up stuff to, to answer. And a lot of people would be like, oh, like, this thing is dumb. It doesn't even know how many like, files, language files are, are in my code. And so we've had to work around um, how to present uh, the kind of like the nature of, of this tool to, to, to people in order to kind of like level set expectations. Awesome. Yeah, I think you know the ability to understand a code base is on the critical path to becoming a contributor to open source projects. So I want to come back to that as we talk about what the future on ramp looks like. But before we get there, Jono, you know, you help a lot of folks figure out how to like build and and bring people into their communities. Like, hmm. what are you most excited about when it comes to AI and open source? I think there's a number of things. One of the things that keeps cropping up in the DevRel and community world is people are primarily using AI for like content creation and things like that. And there's this big debate going on around, you know, do we want content created by AI? And my view is yes, we 100% do because I don't want a DevRel person or a community manager or a maintainer spending 45 minutes creating a piece of content. I want, I want them spending 45 minutes engaging with their audience, building relationships, building trust, fostering and mentoring those relationships. And what I love about AI is there's an opportunity to really automate or at least speed up a lot of that kind of manual work that goes into building, building great communities. And the other thing that I, I think is exciting about it as well is just tremendous insight. Like we've got a member in the Community Leadership Corps, for example, that's just dealing with massive amounts of Slack data. And in next to no time with ChatGPT, you can actually identify patterns in that data that you can then use to make decisions to, to build better engagement and scale it up. To me, we shouldn't need people who've been building communities for 20 years to help us build communities. We should be able to use these tools to give us wisdom. I don't wanna see dashboards. I don't wanna see numbers and graphs. It's not interesting. What I wanna see is, some, uh, is a tool saying, this is the next step for you in what you're doing in your, in your open source project. And we've never seen that before until we had AI, AI. And so like realistically, how much are you seeing in the wild, like people already embracing and using these tools to help fuel the growth of their communities? I'd say it's getting going. Um, I think people are using it right now for the obvious use cases, content being one of them. Uh, a lot of people are generating content, but what they're doing is they're using it as a tool to save them writing words down which to me is not the right way to do it. Because as anyone who's used ChatGPT will know, uh, if you ask it to create a blog post, you, you're gonna get garbage. But when you feed it information, so for example, one of the things I do is I take transcripts and videos that I, mm -hmm. I, I answer questions for my members, I feed it the transcript and then I ask it to create content for me. And the results are brilliant, apart from statistics. It's terrible at statistics. <laughs> um, so I'm starting to see those kinds of use cases and data analysis beyond that not a huge amount going on. So not, not code writing, not doc writing, no. not your C, it's no. more about content and that, no that part of engagement. No some docs. Uh, and I also want to see it impact translations as well. Like when we were at Canonical, we, Ubuntu was translated into like 160 languages, all manual labor. Mm. We should be using AI, AI for that, so. Yeah, great point. And Bian, what what are you most excited about when you think about the impact that opens, uh, AI can have? 
Yeah, um, actually, just first off, you <laughs> mentioned uh, kind of like Slack engagement uh, as a use case. If anyone has created the kind of like AI Slack bot yet, uh, please let me know, because <laughs> I, I feel like that's something that I want, like answering all the questions I do in Slack day to day and also for our kind of contributor community. I think another cool use case would be uh, having a bot in Discord or, or Slack that can answer commonly asked questions that people have. We get all sorts of people coming into our community either wanting to use uh, Cody or contribute to Cody, and there's just like not enough humans uh, in the room to answer all the questions. Um, but in terms of what I'm excited about for AI's impact on uh, developers and, and open source at large, I think the main thing that excites me is when I think about like my job as, as a programmer, I would say like somewhere between 90 and 95% of my job is actually a form of toil. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, there's all the annoying stuff that you would rather not do. Um, for me, it's things like, uh, I don't know, like all the difficulty of like figuring out where something lives in the code base, right? Like if you ask me to implement a simple issue, oftentimes it's not, not actually that simple if you don't have the context or the awareness or the familiarity of, of that code. Uh, maybe it's something like, you know, if you're a maintainer reviewing like a, a hundred file pull request, like someone's put all this work uh, into building this fancy new feature, but now you are the one, you, you didn't get the enjoyment of actually writing the feature, you just got to review the, the huge uh, PR. <laughs> and so like those things of toil, I think they're perfect uh, matches for AI. Um, in, in, in that, like anything that can be reduced to uh, kind of like a very non-creative, almost mechanical task of like, go through and do this thing. It's similar to something that you've done or someone else has done you know, a million times before somewhere. Uh, go and essentially do the same thing, but you know, pattern match it for this specific use case. That's a perfect AI use case. And I think that uh, the, the more mature the technology becomes and the, the AI coding tools become, the more and more of that toil we can uh, automate away. You mentioned bots on Slack. There, yep. This does, in my mind, present a problem though, which is, um, I emailed the other day a member of Angela who organizes these events, that her team, mm -hmm. who responded immediately, and I honestly thought they were a bot. <laughs> <laughs> They're so efficient. They're, They're already the, among us. Yeah. <laughs> efficiency may be penalized as we move forward. The it's LF true. events team, always on point. We love you all. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, one, you know, I think really hot topic that we'll explore throughout the summit, too, is maintainer burnout. I know it's something I think about a lot, given how much of our world today relies on these open source projects. Like, how can AI tools help? How will they help, you know, alleviate some of the pressure and stress and just a burden on maintainers? Who, who wants to jump at that first? Um, I, I, I think this is going to be an interesting one because I think burnout is a uniquely human problem. And when we, and I'm not a psychologist by any stretch, but when we unpick it, uh, I kind of go back to the burnout cycle, which was a study done a number of years ago. It was published in Scientific American uh, Mind. Um, and there's, you know, additional, like layers and layers of burnout. Nobody burns out immediately. And this is something we see all the time with maintainers and open source communities, right? Is that it's, it's, a, it's a series of paper cuts. Where I think AI will be interesting here in the short term will be identifying patterns in behavior and even potentially sentiment analysis, which has got a set of questions attached to it, uh, where we can start seeing the signals. Right now, I think when, when we've all experienced this in this room, when you see someone who you work with or a family member or a friend and they're burning out, you spot the signals, but it depends on us spotting the signals. And I think there's some opportunity there for AI to have some tripwires where we can see that and then we can step in as a human. But I actually think when we go into the future, but not necessarily Terminator 2 future, um, <laughs> We're already seeing right now AI have this amazing ability to, to do role play. Like if you, this is an interesting thing you can do right now with ChatGPT, is if you say to ChatGPT, you are a, and then you describe, uh, you describe that persona. Like when I was launching the Community Leadership Core, I said, you are a business coach with expertise with founders who are familiar with open source and early stage startups. And I asked it a series of questions and the results were profoundly interesting. And we'll get to a point, I think, where AI will be good enough to start providing some level of guidance when it comes to burnout. But of course, there's a lot of ethical questions around that as well. Yeah. Um, 
going back to what we talked about before about like this on ramp to open source, you know, back at GitHub, I used to talk about how we had this huge developer shortage and like where are the next 50 million developers going to come from and how do we build the right on ramps to open source? And there have been a, a few comments about translations, for example, from an accessibility standpoint, but like, what do you think about Beyond in terms of how can we leverage these tools to bring more folks into open source? I think that's a really good question. I think maybe um, a, a hidden part of your question is a question I think is on a lot of people's minds, which is, you know, d does AI is, is AI going to expand the number of developers in the world, or is it going to decrease the number of developers we need because you know uh, it gets much more efficient to to create software? Um, and personally, I'm I'm on the side of it's it's going to vastly expand the number uh, of developers um, because. I think that the demand for good software uh, far outpaces uh, the pace at which we're able to supply it right now. Like, if you look at like what software is available today, I would actually say you know most software that people use uh, is is not very good. Uh, to, to be quite honest, there's like tons of bugs, there's usability issues, and by far like the limiting constraint is the number of talented, uh, highly qualified uh, people in the world that can speak you know programming languages. Uh, uh, effectively, uh, and so I, I think that uh, the impact of AI is, is in effect, going to kind of like loosen that constraint. And what we're going to see is uh, both an influx of people coming in to the kind of field of software creation, uh, people who don't necessarily have you know four-year computer science degrees, um, who are now enabled to create software just by being able to kind of speak natural language to uh, an AI interface, which then does the, the translation of programming languages. And also um, uh, providing a point of leverage to uh, people with experience, senior developers, um, who can now uh, project their influence out uh, into the world, into their code bases, um, much more effectively, because they don't have to manually review every single pull request. They can kind of use these tools to kind of um, be, be a, a, a leverage point, really, to, to kind of Get visibility into what's going on in the code, and and to ensure that there's kind of coherency and consistency to the code base uh, as a whole. Yeah, I mean, a question that I have been pondering a lot is, as code gen models get more sophisticated, like I hear you on the the end product, right? Like, what are people building? What's the what's the end result? But a question is like, what happens? in the middle, you know, if you look at the number of NPM modules or, or, or pick a category of open source, like, do we actually need as many of the building blocks or are models going to kind of coalesce around a specific set of best practices and perhaps like shrink the building blocks and it's gonna be those final outputs that become, and by shrink, I mean shrink the number of them. And it's the final outputs that are kind mm -hmm. of harnessing human creativity um, to create you know, different apps that we might need for a million different things. Like, mm. How do you think about that? Like, like in other words, maybe there'll be fewer um, like like open source libraries, primitives. more like yeah. end user applications, because mm -hmm. now it's just like, like it, it, most new entry, uh, entrants into the field will probably want to create applications, because that's the thing that's more tangible to the end user. Yeah. Uh, and and maybe the the um, the adoption of, of models for, for code will reduce the need for effective kind of abstractions. Mm. Uh, exactly. Which is what libraries have traditionally done, right? Exactly. Yeah, I mean, modularity yeah. is a human function to understand code in small chunks and reuse, mm -hmm. right? Although to me, this does beg the question of, I think we're going to get to a point where, right now without picking a specific number, a developer can crank out a certain amount of code and understand a certain amount of code, to your point earlier on. Mm -hmm. We're going to get to a point where, with AI, developers are generating way, way more code. And I think that's going to have a visibility issue. Like Everybody's talking about code generation, but to me, a big chunk of this is really understanding code and how it operates and how it works. And then pairing that with you know, efficiency. right? Like, I mean, for the old people in the room, like myself, we all remember what it was like when you know, um, you take a game like Doom, you fit it on a floppy disk, you can't do that anymore, right? Mm -hmm. So if we're generating all this code, there's a, there's a performance issue as well, and performance in terms of understanding the code as well as just operating code quickly, so. Yeah, but how, how long will it be that we actually need to understand all the inside bits of the code when you think about the next generation right. of developers but coming online. Maybe an extreme version of your question is like, 
would do, do AI uh, uh, coders, coding models, whatever you want to call them, do they potentially eliminate the need for maybe like a layer of abstraction? Yeah. Right? Because now uh, your AI coding uh, tool can speak, I don't know, like a low level uh, language. Yeah. And so we don't need the high level framework anymore to make the right. low level bits more accessible to a human. I think that's entirely within the realm of. Uh, possibilities like maybe maybe there are certain pieces of software infrastructure that are uh, there's less demand for them now because um, the process of writing I guess like toilsome or uh, code that's similar to code that already exists somewhere out there has has gotten a lot cheaper and easier with the advent of, of AI coding models. Yeah. yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I agree because I just think the <laughs> the psychology of human beings will always be there. Like right now, nobody cares about the machine code that GCC is spitting out, right, or Assembler, because mm -hmm. um, that's a very targeted set of abstraction. But you know, any large organization today, if they're going to bring in a a, a, you know, a piece of software, they do a security audit and things like that. And I just wonder what that's got. I think mm -hmm. technologically we'll get there. Mm -hmm. But I, my kind of take is human beings, we're, we're going to be the slowest link in the chain, right? Yeah. And human anxiety, insecurity, fear, especially as we face more cyber threats as well, I suspect that that may hold us back, which will be an interesting, an interesting moment in technology as well. I'll, I'll make one prediction, which I, th I think that I don't know about whether this will eliminate the need for like a you know your favorite web framework or whatever uh, layer of abstraction um, in whatever ecosystem is 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 yours of, of choice. But I think this will enable the ecosystem to iterate more quickly on on those abstractions because yeah. I think one of the things that happens now is this sort of like ossification over time. Like any sort of adoption of a new framework or abstraction, you're essentially taking a platform dependency. Uh, on that API, and the switching cost is non-zero. In fact, right now it's it's very high to port your application from one framework or uh, mm -hmm. one you know system to another. I think with with uh, as as AI matures um, in in coding, I think these kind of like large scale code transformations where you're like, oh, I, I want to migrate this thing to that thing will become a lot more tractable because mm -hmm. the sort of tedious task of like, you know, translating you know, Angular to React or, or, or whatnot, <laughs> yeah. or vice versa, um, it will become a lot easier. Yeah. You'll have a, 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 like a bulldozer that you can use now instead of ha hacking away at stuff with a, a, you know, a, a pick and shovel. AI, yeah. the bulldozer of the future. Yeah, <laughs> you exactly. Heard, you heard it here first. I think we're at time. I mean, I, we could go on for hours. There are so many interesting questions. I think we all have as you know, AI continues to evolve. So I hope you all continue to be you know part of the conversation throughout the summit and uh, as time goes on. But thank you very much. Thank you to both of you for coming. I really appreciate the time. All right, uh, our next speaker is very qualified to answer all of those previous questions as well, uh, but is here to talk about a different uh, topic. Uh, this one I'm actually really excited about because uh, I never thought I would see the day where a cloud vendor is open sourcing a technology that enables multi-cloud to actually work, but that is what our next speaker uh, is going to do. Um, Mark Rusinovich, the CTO of Azure, uh, is here to tell us about a new open source project, Radius. Uh, please welcome to the stage, Mark Rusinovich. So I'm really excited to share with you Project Radius this morning. First, I want to thank uh, Jim and the Linux Foundation for giving us this platform to share this exciting news with you. The fact is, though, that this isn't the first time that Microsoft or Azure have contributed something to open source that works across different platforms. In fact, Project Radius comes from the Azure Incubations team, which I lead, which has several projects that are already part of CNCF, and some of you might be familiar with some of these. How many people have heard of CADA? So that was the first project that we uh, created about four years ago when the team was just two people. But since then, we've got several other projects that we've been we've submitted and actually gra uh, on, hopefully on the verge of graduating uh, as projects in CNCF. One of them is Dapper. How many people have heard of Dapper? So that one 
is designed to work across all cloud platforms. In fact, when we first launched it, we supported all three cloud platforms, all the th three major hyperscalers, that is. And then the most recent one we just submitted to CNCF was Project Copacetic, which is aimed at patching to, uh, container images for better security for those images. But Radius, actually, the journey towards Radius started even back when I started in Azure in 2010, as I started to look at the evolution of cloud-native computing, especially the rise of Kubernetes. And what we've seen is that it's become more and more difficult for developers to build applications. Back in the old days, it was my three-tier or two-tier SOA application. Today, it's microservices. And today, it's microservices that are complex to monitor, to manage, and people have to continuously update and, and operate them, which they didn't really have to before in the old waterfall days of software development. Troubleshooting them is difficult because of all of the systems that are interacting to support an application. And then most enterprises are having difficulty in enforcing best practices inside of those applications, making sure that developers fall into pit of successes. And then finally, developers now have to worry about not just running on a single box, but running across different environments, making sure that the application works in the on-prem environment that they've got, making sure that it works on the cloud provider that they've got. And many enterprise customers have multiple cloud providers where they want to make sure that the tooling is consistent across them and that they can take applications or components and run them across them. And this is exactly what Radius was designed to do, recognizing that Kubernetes has become the de facto cloud application infrastructure. This is what, when I go talk to enterprises about what their strategy is for cloud-native computing, they actually answer with one word, CNCF. That's almost always what I hear, is my strategy is CNCF. And at the core of CNCF, of course, is Kubernetes. And they want Kubernetes because it works everywhere that they want to deploy their applications. And it's got this thriving open source community behind it. It works on Amazon, Azure, Google, on-premises. But the fact is that Kubernetes only solves part of their problem. And so they've got to turn to a ton of other tools to finish out what it means to create a cloud-native application. Not just the compute parts of it, but then they go to Helm charts to be able to configure an application in its infrastructure. But Helm has to transform into the other pieces of the application that aren't just running on the Kubernetes cluster, like the cloud services that the application depends on managed services from the cloud pro providers that I mentioned, open source services that they might deploy in their on-premises infrastructure. All of this kind of tied together with bailing wire and duct tape through bash scripts and PowerShell scripts. And so creating an application has become just a, a, a jury rig kind of exercise. Not just that, but once you deploy the application, this is what you're left with you see the infrastructure merged in with the application, and you don't see anything about the relationship between the resources. Find the front end here. Find the back end. Find the cache that the front end is using. And it's, you just don't understand what's going on here, which, again, is another challenge when it comes to troubleshooting this thing or understanding where the dependencies are that might cause this application to have performance issues or reliability issues. So that's what Radius, like I said, was designed to address all of these kinds of challenges, trying to simplify the job of developers and make it possible for the operators or platform engineers to make sure the developers are falling into the pit of success as defined by their own enterprise, because every other enterprise has its own definition of best practices. Not just that, but developers oftentimes aren't the ones deploying and operating an application, and the application might go to different environments might go to a region in the US where you've just launched the, app, the service that the application's supporting. So it requires a very small footprint. But over in Europe, requires a very large footprint because you've been operating there for a few years and you have lots of customers. The developer doesn't have, want to worry about those concerns. It's the people that are operating making sure that the application's there servicing them. So Radius, designed from the start, to enable this collaboration between a developer and a platform engineer or IT ops person, which in some cases, if you're full stack, might be the same person, but being able to clearly delineate, here's my application and here's the infrastructure, and to support the creation of that infrastructure through something called recipes, and this is where the best practices get defined. And then when you have the output of this, you have an application graph. 
a graph that shows you the relationship between the compute components of the application and the managed services or services that it requires to run. Understanding those relationships and being incented to leverage Radius as support for it because it's actually gonna do things for you that are very helpful that you would either otherwise have to do by hand. And then finally, like I said, every enterprise customer I talk to, just about every one, worries about deploying an application you know, on-premises environment and a hyperscale public cloud. And like I said, many of them support multiple. So right off the bat, we knew we have to make sure Radius supports all these environments, not just Azure or not just Kubernetes. Now, just to give you a, a, another level of look at the way Radius works, an application developer or architect defines the structure of their application. They define it in the terms they understand, a gateway, a front-end container, a back-end container, or microservice. The front-end requires a Redis cache. The back-end requires a state store to store the state of the application in a Mongo database, for example. And they then, or an IT ops person, defines an environment basically a landing zone for the application. The environment is configured through something called recipes that bind those components of the application to the infrastructure, and it does this dynamically. So you can take the application, in this case, bind it through a, to a local Kubernetes environment using the recipes for a local Kubernetes implementation of Redis and Mongo. But then you can also swap that out then. That might be your dev test environment go to a production environment on Azure, and the recipes for that environment bind that infrastructure to Azure Redis Cache and Azure Cosmos DB, implementations of those services that are native to Azure. And then running, of course, on the managed Kubernetes service in Azure. Then create another environment in another cloud provider, AWS, and bind them through recipes to native resources or services for that cloud provider. MemoryDB and DocumentDB, and deploy into EKS. Radius makes this possible with that developers not, ha or the IT operators not having to change the description of the application, being able to take that as an immutable artifact and then bind it to the infrastructure. Now, Radius, then, for the application, consists of a core set of resources those components that describe those compute-based microservices, the containers, connections between the containers, gateway, and a secret store, kind of fundamentals of your compute core building blocks of an application. It supports a set of standard resources, and so I meant it, mentioned Redis and Mongo in that example that I gave you, but it supports out of the box right now several other standard resources, including Dapper, and with Dapper, Dapper specified resources, now you have true portability across different environments, not just for the code, but also the application definition. And then it supports resources, the managed resources from, all the from AWS and Azure and Kubernetes off the bat. We're gonna be adding more for GCP and Alibaba and other cloud providers going forward. We hope others will help contribute to that. And then finally, as far as landing zones, landing environments, it supports Kubernetes, like I said, any CNCF a certified distro, including the managed Kubernetes implementations across these cloud, cloud providers. Now, to give you a deeper look, we've got some demos here. The demos are from two perspectives. One of them is the platform engineering perspective. And I've got two Ryans, in fact, here to show you that. They happen to be consistently both named Ryan. The first Ryan I'm going to uh, bring up on stage here is Ryan Umstead who's gonna be the platform engineering persona. He's from BlackRock, and he's gonna show you how he's gonna be creating the uh, Radius environment with recipes, where the application's gonna land that the other Ryan is gonna deploy. So, Ryan. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Ryan Umstead. I'm a senior engineer at BlackRock, leading a platform engineering team. We've been working with Mark's team to help shape the direction of Radius. In today's landscape of ever-evolving cloud complexities, it's imperative to streamline our application SDLC. It's essential that our internal developers can rapidly access cloud resources while meeting the standards of a highly regulated financial industry. We see Radius as a way to enhance collaboration between our development and platform teams. Through its unique offering of Radius recipes, 
The platform empowers developers to tap into vital cloud resources like Kubernetes and storage solutions without the need to grasp the intricate details of these underlying systems. For example, when our developers need some kind of cloud storage resource, like a Redis cache, recipes ensure that the cache meets the cost, operations, and security requirements that BlackRock has. Our engage engagement with the Radius team stems from our advocacy for open source solutions within our own technology platform, Aladdin. We believe this approach holds significant potential to resonate with the cloud native community. Let me walk you all through a demo. Here is a sample my team has created as part of our experimentation with Radius. This recipe is, a bicep, is using the BICEP infrastructure as code language, open sourced by Microsoft. I could have just as easily used Terraform. Here you can see I've defined an Azure Redis cache, which can be assumed by any of our developers. Let me walk you through some of the specific parameters that help us make sure we're meeting our cost, operation, and security concerns. On lines eight through 16, you can see we're selecting a standard SKU. We can adapt that parameter based on our compute or budgeting requirements. As another example, we've set the enable non-SSL port to false for encryption and transit. There are a bunch of other parameters in here to ensure that that Redis cache gets deployed as we require. The developer of an app won't have to understand any of these configuration choices. They just need to call the recipe, and the cache will be up when their app is deployed. Mark mentioned that one of these things recipes do is connect the application to the resource created by the recipe, or bind it. This should feel magical to the developers, since they are not only getting a resource provisioned, but their app is automatically connected to it. Recipes are able to wire up these connections using that result object lower on the screen. As you can see, there's a host, a port, and a password parameter that gets fed into the application. So the application knows which host to connect to, the port, and password, as expected. Now that we've set up this recipe, let's store it and register it with a Redis environment, Radius environment, excuse me. So as you can see, I'm running a command to publish. We're publishing it into an OCI compliant registry, which means organizations can use the registries that they're familiar with today. And just like that, it's published. Next, I need to register the recipe with a specific environment. Radius environments enable a se separation of concerns between our developer and platform teams. We want our developers focused on creating their applications, and my team can handle the configuration of the environments. These environments can include a variety of cloud resources, like a cache, messaging queues, or any other service required by the application. Since BlackRock deploys its software to many regions across multiple geographic locations, we can use environments to handle these regional variances. For instance, my Redis cache may be larger in Europe than in North America. The recipe attached to our environment encapsulates that difference without developers' code or configuration changing. Earlier, I created an environment called Aladdin Test West US 2. Now I'm going to register my Redis recipe with that environment. And with that, I'm all finished. I created a recipe to deploy a Redis cache. That recipe outputs the data necessary for Radius to wire the cache into a developer's application. I published that recipe into an OCI registry and then registered it with a Radius environment. At this point, the recipe is ready to use. And I'm gonna hand it off to Ryan Nowak, who is going to share how developers use recipes when they build their applications. We've actually got another Ryan in the back in case one of us has a bug. This is true. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Ryan Nowak. I'm a developer on the Azure Incubations team at Microsoft, and I'm the creator of Radius. As part of building Radius, we talk to over 70 cloud customers about the challenges their developers face when managing applications. Our conversations highlighted the complexity that the developers face working with Kubernetes and cloud resources, and especially working with them together. What we heard is that it's a pain for developers to get access to cloud resources like databases. It's doubly a pain to wire those up and troubleshoot access problems. If I'm having some kind of problem, I'd likely need to have a back and forth with someone like Ryan. It could take a long time to figure out. This is why we created recipes for on-demand provisioning that follows the organization's policy controls. In this demo, I'm gonna show you how I can use Radius in my existing Helm chart, 
and then I'm going to deploy that to a local dev environment on my workstation, and then I'm going to deploy to the cloud using the environment that Ryan just created for me. This is an example of how Radius can help platform engineers and developers collaborate and use the cloud in a way that meets all of our requirements and standards. I've already set up my configuration locally for a dev environment and to use the Radius environment on Azure that Ryan created for me. So first let me show you the application. And this is just a normal Helm chart. So this is a to-do application that I've already created. And we're starting with an application that I've already created and containerized because Radius works with your existing code and containers. Now, this is a to-do application and I need a database. And so in this case, I'm gonna use a Redis cache. Now, I think in an enterprise environment, many of us would need to file a ticket or call somebody or ask for access or maybe there's a portal. Um, instead, I'm gonna use a recipe and have Radius create the Redis cache for me. So I can do that by just adding this little snippet of YAML here. So this is a CRD that we've defined inside of Radius. And you can see down at the bottom that I'm asking for Redis cache. And that matches up with the way that Ryan registered the recipe. When I deploy this to Kubernetes, Radius is going to use the recipe that's configured in that specific environment to create the Redis cache. So in my cloud environment, it's gonna use the recipe that you just saw. And in my local dev environment, it's going to come with a recipe, or it's gonna use a recipe that comes with Radius. So when we set up these local dev environments as part of Radius, there's a bunch of recipes that are part of the open source project, and they just run popular technologies on uh, your containerized infrastructure. So you don't need a cloud account to get started. So I've got my Kubernetes deployment and recipe for, Radia, for Redis, but I need to say something about how they're connected to each other. So I'm gonna add some annotations here. And so first what I'm doing is I'm enabling Radius for this deployment. So Radius will be aware of it and process it. And then second of all, I'm declaring that connection. So I'm saying that the pods created by this deployment need to be able to talk to that Redis. Radius will use this connection information to inject settings into the application. If this were a different type of resource like an S3 bucket or Azure storage account, Radius might do things like configure networking, uh, manage identity access or IAM permissions on AWS. Again, we want this to feel like magic to developers as much as possible. Also, since Radius knows about the connection, it's gonna use that information to catalog the relationship and the infrastructure as part of the application. This contributes to what we call the application graph. And the idea is that everyone in the organization, not just the people who work on the application, can have a shared picture of what's in that application and its architecture. So now I'm ready to try this out in my local dev environment. And so I can just deploy this like any other Helm chart. So you're gonna see a terminal pop up here. Uh, and I'm just running a normal Helm install to install this. And that's done. I'm gonna fast forward a little bit to the point where everything has been set up. And again, this is just my local dev environment. You can see context testing. This is, this is the environment where I'm trying this out on my workstation. And we're just querying the status of everything. Uh, and if you don't understand this, that's okay. I think Kubernetes is a little complicated and this is a lot to fit on the screen. But I wanna highlight for you at the top, there's the two pods there. So one of those is running Redis and that was created by the recipe. And then there's my web app container that I asked for. Down at the bottom, you can see our recipe CRD and the status is ready. To explore this a little, bit, uh, d a little bit more in detail, let's go look at the application graph for this, which I can get with the Radius CLI. So at the top, you can see our container is defined, uh, and we have the connection from the web app container to the Redis database. At the bottom, you can see the Redis cache, and we understand that there's a connection coming in from the web app. And then what's going on with these resource sections is we're cataloging all of the infrastructure. So in this case, uh, since we had a local dev recipe, that local dev recipe is just self-hosting Redis on Kubernetes. And so you can see that we've cataloged the outputs of the recipe there. This is a text mode version of this. We're working on an actual visualization of it, which I think is a little, little easier to kind of get your head around. Um, let's quickly prove that this worked. Uh, since this is running inside of a Kubernetes cluster, I'm gonna open a port forward here. Uh, and then once that's open, I can pop my browser. we we'll start testing this out. So on this screen, uh, I'm gonna show you just quickly, you can see the settings that were injected by Radius. So we got the URL, host name, port, password, all the things that the application code is gonna need to be able to communicate with that. And then on this page, I'm just gonna quickly prove this works by, by testing it out. So you can see that's completed and, and we've been able to work with the app. So now, before I go to the cloud, just one more thing. Um, Mark mentioned, you know, all the enterprises we talk to are, are multi-cloud. 
And, and during our customer conversations, this came up a lot. A lot of enterprises today are going through this, this sort of platform engineering transition. And, and we found that when we talked to them that they all see platform engineering as kind of a multi-cloud endeavor. Uh, that's just the reality is platform teams in large enterprises need to support all the places where they need to run code. Um, and we know that Kubernetes is ubiquitous. It's everywhere, as we said. It's kind of become the common app runtime for the industry. And in part, Kubernetes success owes to the fact that it works the same everywhere. It works the same on-prem as it does in every cloud. And so it's a great leveler. And it'd be awesome if more of the tools that we used as developers worked the same for every cloud. As an open source project, Radius is embracing the multi-cloud reality that we live in. So even though we started this project at Microsoft, we built AWS support into Radius, and we're going to work with the community to continue to enhance it over the coming months. We'd love for more of you to join us and help build support for more things and more clouds. We also know that many organizations have a deep investment in Terraform, and we want to make sure that they can continue to leverage that investment with Radius. So here's an example of a Terraform recipe for AWS. And what I'm doing here is I just, I pulled something from the public module gallery. That's that source reference there by the cursor. And then I, I customized some things that I wanted to customize. And I kind of wrapped this up into a recipe. So this just serves as an example of how you can use your existing Terraform investment with Radius, or you can use existing open source Terraform modules if you want. By the way, um, we saw the BICEP infrastructure as code language earlier, which is an open source project for Microsoft. We've also built BICEP support for AWS. And we're going to continue to invest in that as part of Radius. Our philosophy is that we're unopinionated about the kind of tools and infrastructure as code technologies you want to use. And we're going to empower the cloud native community to build whatever kinds of integrations that they think are valuable. So just imagine in the background, I've gone through the same steps that Ryan has. I created a EKS cluster on AWS. I configured an AWS environment and I wired up this recipe. And then remember that I've also got that Azure environment that Ryan set up for me earlier. And so it, in this next step, I'm going to deploy to both clouds. So here in my terminal, you can see I've got Aladdin test West US 2 on top, and I've got you know, my production AWS environment on the bottom. And again, it's just a Helm deploy. Um, as Mark mentioned earlier, I didn't have to change any of my application code or any of my Helm charts to be able to deploy to multiple clouds. I have different recipes in those environments, and Radius is going to swap the infrastructure for me. So, just to prove this works, I'm not going to bring up the app again, but let's, let's look at the application graph output for both of these clouds, and we'll see a little bit of how it's different. And I, I realize there's a lot of text to fit on the screen, so maybe a little bit hard to read. The thing I'd ask you to focus on is the Redis cache there, and you're going to see you know, different results. So in our local test environment, we were just running in Kubernetes, but here you can see we've got that Microsoft cache Redis. So this is, again, using the recipe that Ryan wrote for me and provisioning that Microsoft cache in a way that, that BlackRock wants it to be provisioned. On the bottom, we executed that Terraform recipe, and we got an AWS MemoryDB cluster, which is one of their hosted services for Redis. So to wrap up, Ryan Umstead wrote a recipe for Azure and configured an environment for me. For platform engineers like Ryan, Radius enables them to provide a self-serve provisioning experience to their development teams. And it's going to create all the cloud resources in a way that enforces their standards and best practices. For me, the developer, Radius has given me a simplified interface to the cloud and works with tools like Helm that I'm already using. And then when I can be confident that the cloud resources I need will be created in the right way without becoming an expert myself. I can also be confident that my dependencies would be wired into the application in a way that makes me more productive. Lastly, Radius is going to automatically catalog the infrastructure, relationships, and architecture, and give the whole team a shared picture of the application. So we're going to bring Mark and Ryan back up here and, and wrap Thanks, up. Ryan. So you've seen, I think, demonstration of how Radius is setting out to solve those problems that I discussed at the beginning by separating concerns between the platform engineers and the developers, by supporting multiple clouds, by giving a a graphical view, a graph-based view of an application architecture, and also supporting many different environments, the on-premises Kubernetes as well as multiple clouds. And like you would probably imagine, Radius is following in the same footsteps as the other Azure Incubations projects. And I'm excited to announce that yesterday we submitted Radius to the CNCF. <laughs> Which is why we're here. We're here, <laughs> obviously. Uh, we want 
everybody to join us and to flesh this out. We don't, you know, speaking about Jim, we're humble about what we're doing. We don't think or believe that we have all the answers here. We don't think we've got it all figured out. And there's a tremendous amount of work to do to really make this, Use the clicker. Oh, to really make this, whoops, to really make this <laughs> something. Okay. Nothing's working. All right, there we go. To really, to really make this address everybody's needs. Everybody's going to have slightly different requirements and different preferences about how Radius is, works. So please join us. There you can see the links to the landing pay, site for Radius, where you'll find the documentation, tutorials, and source code to the to-do application you saw. And there's the GitHub repo where you can hopefully come and join us and contribute. So thank you very much. And a thanks again to the Linux Foundation and Jim for giving us this opportunity to share this with you. Thanks, Ryan. Um, how many people are going to be at KubeCon in a couple of weeks? All right, so for those of you who are coming, which looks like most of you, uh, and for those of you who are going to be seeing this uh, online, I'm sure you can learn a lot more about Radius uh, at KubeCon. Uh, I suspect that Microsoft will have uh, a lot of information about Radius uh, in their booth uh, at KubeCon, so definitely go check it out. Uh, my only critique to the two Ryans and Mark is that you missed a wonderful opportunity to name this Rideus. <laughs> Just saying. Um, so <laughs> let me introduce our next speaker, uh, Brian Che. You know, we've been hearing a lot of talk this year about artificial intelligence. Uh, and uh, Brian is going to uh, talk to us today about keeping uh, open open when it comes to AI. Please welcome uh, Brian Shea, the Chief Strategy Officer from Huawei. Morning, everyone. Uh, it's great to be back here and uh, be in this room with all of you here. So. There's been a lot of uh, discussions and a lot of, uh, you could say, controversies uh, over the last few months just in terms of uh, what is really open. And we've seen a lot of changes uh, you know, over the last uh, you know, year or so just in terms of uh, how do we start to think about open source technologies and the communities that we're engaged in. Uh, we've seen things that were previously uh, available uh, under uh, you know, different open source practices that are no longer available for us to download and to use. Uh, we've seen uh, license changes uh, from different products and technologies that we depend upon. Uh, and so uh, whether uh, they continue to remain open uh, is a big concern. We have a lot of new technologies in the AI space that claim to be open, uh, but when you take a look at the licensing behind them, uh, they aren't open at all. Uh, and uh, we also even have a lot of different regulations around the world, all looking to regulate uh, for very good reasons around cybersecurity, but that start to place restrictions on how open source software can be developed. Uh, so I wanted to take a few minutes uh, this morning just to talk with you all today in terms of when we think about uh, what it means to be open, uh, what are the things that really, really count, and how do we work together to make sure that we can protect this community that we all work together in? Uh, because if we don't uh, ensure that open really remains open, uh, it's going to create a lot of problems for all of us here, both in this room uh, but around the world. So let me start uh, just uh, with a little bit. Now, when we say, you know, it's going to be open, uh, first of all, it has to be open source. And by open source, we mean uh, under an OSI-approved open source license, full stop. So this is really uh, fundamental uh, because we've seen uh, very recently, especially with a lot of the AI technologies and all sorts of things and arguments around, well, we need to keep it more open uh, than it used to be. But if it's not fully open source, it creates a lot of problems in terms of how do we use the technologies. Uh, so, for example, earlier this year, uh, we re released a new open source uh, project called Quasar. Uh, this is focused on how do we start to build uh, different uh, sandbox container runtimes. So if you're using an OCI container, if you're using WebAssembly or others, how do we start to build these heterogeneous infrastructures uh, for cloud-native workloads? And this kind of technology, if it's not fully open source, you can't depend upon it. You can't build your applications on it. You can't build your business upon it. Uh, so, uh, no, we released this under the Apache license, uh, but in a sign of the times, we actually had to put on the website, uh, no, this project is free for personal or commercial use, absolutely uh, no restrictions at all. This isn't something that we necessarily had to think about doing in the past, uh, but it's very important that when we take a look at how do we build open technologies that we still build on open source licenses. 
Another key aspect about being open is that we put things under open governance. Uh, so, uh, for example, uh, another project that we donated uh, here to CNCF uh, is our CubeEdge project. And we've had a lot of success uh, with our deployments. Uh, you've seen uh, maybe at some of the KubeCons where we have this out in uh, satellites in space or in uh, automobiles around the world and so on. Uh, but one of the important things uh, for us is that uh, within the CNCF, uh, there's an IP policy uh, as part of the charter. Nobody likes to read these documents, uh, but it's very fundamental to what we do. Because as part of the IP uh, charter, it says that you know, code must be open source. It cannot be relicensed, and it cannot be withheld. And when you think about you know, just some of the issues uh, that we've been talking about today, whether about relicensing or w withholding different code or different artifacts around uh, different projects, this is really important because when we put things into open governance, we share the responsibility and we share the access, and no company can unilaterally make decisions around how do we keep things available for access. It's very important that we have open governance around our projects as well. Third aspect of being open. Uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, companies in the open source community uh, that really want to have uh, their cake and to eat it too. Uh, so they want to be able to use open source and build end users and build uh, technologies and gain attraction uh, towards it. But they want to keep all the business benefits uh, for themselves. Uh, they don't want others to be able to participate and benefit uh, from the open source business uh, opportunities that come from that set of technologies. Uh, we don't think that's right. Uh, we think that when you start to work together in open source, the opportunity is to build a brand new, much bigger business opportunity that we all share together around and we all build ecosystems around. Uh, so for example, uh, earlier this year, we also open sourced a new technology called uh, Quasar. Uh, sorry, I mean uh, called Expanse. Uh, and what Expanse is focused on is building a set of capabilities uh, so that across a, a different set of uh, public cloud providers, you can build portable managed services that go from cloud to cloud to cloud. Uh, one of the things uh, that a third party company called Decision uh, in France uh, did uh, earlier this year was they conducted a research study just to say what would be the impact of the European cloud market uh, if we were to have this project and as it continues to grow. And one of the things that they found was that this project would be able to support the growth of the European cloud market uh, from its current 14% and accelerate it uh, to 279%. Huge, huge increase in terms of business opportunity for everyone to participate in. And so when we take a look at how do we open source technologies, it's very important that we all have equal opportunity to grow in a growing uh, ecosystem together. Another huge uh, benefit and a key aspect of being open is that we have open participation for everybody involved, whether from big or from small. I want to start from a big standpoint uh, first off. Uh, so uh, for those of you uh, uh, who were at the Open Source Summit in Europe uh, with Linux Foundation, uh, you probably saw a lot of news uh, and headlines around uh, the Cyber Resilience Act, uh, the CRA. Uh, but this is something that uh, is uh, proposed European regulation, which will have big impact around the world in terms of how do we uh, start to develop develop open source software. This was designed with very good intentions. How do we protect our software supply chains and make sure that they're usable and trustworthy? Very, very noble goal. Uh, but un uh, intentionally or unintentionally, uh, it also puts uh, regulations in terms of open source and open source foundations, uh, whether they're located in Europe, in the US, in China, or anywhere else in the world, in terms of how that open source can be developed and how it can be made available. Uh, and so one of the things uh, that we did as a company uh, was we just brought to attention that you know, this is something that needs to be changed in order to support open source organizations and their foundations if we want them to be able to continue to provide the valuable service that they do. Uh, I would encourage you, if your organizations have not taken a look at this, uh, you definitely need to pay attention because it will have a big impact both in terms of your products and technologies, but also in the communities uh, that we work together in. And then truly open participation, I just want to end on a little bit of a personal note uh, in terms of how I participate uh, in the open source communities uh, today. Uh, starting on the left, uh, this is about uh, when I first started getting involved in open source, uh, still a, as a university student. And back then, uh, there was a brand new uh, operating system out uh, called Linux, uh, and I was in the process of learning how to install it on my own uh, PC in my dorm room. Uh, and I was asking all these questions uh, just in terms of what to do. Uh, this was an old email I found uh, where I was asking, how do I uh, find all the ways to get root access uh, to a Linux server? Uh, I won't explain what kind of trouble I was getting into uh, in terms of why I 
I wanted root access. Uh, but the thing for me that I really loved uh, was I could go into the community and ask for help, and so many people were willing to help me. Uh, you know, they would answer my questions, uh, they would support me. Uh, you know, I became a developer and so on. Uh, but this was really my first exposure uh, into open source and the community uh, that we can all participate in. Uh, and if we fast forward uh, to uh, just where I am today, uh, you know, I'm in a, a little bit of a, uh, you know, unusual situation. Uh, you know, I'm uh, born and uh, grew up in the U.S. Uh, now, uh, a few years ago, I moved to Hong Kong uh, to work for Huawei uh, in Shenzhen, China. Uh, I spend about uh, five, six months a year uh, in Europe. Uh, and uh, when I take a look at all that, uh, you know, Jim was showing up in his slides just uh, earlier, uh, just in terms of the memes, in terms of what people think he does. Uh, you know, I spend a lot of time on the road, uh, and a lot of people often say, I you know, they're envious uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the opportunities I have. Uh, but for me, uh, it's very important uh, because in today's uh, you know, uh, big global environment, uh, there's a lot of challenges uh, to how do we start to work together from an overall global standpoint uh, in open source. Uh, I have a lot of stories uh, just in terms of whether uh, I'm in uh, the U.S., whether I'm in China, whether I'm in Europe, just in terms of uh, some of the complications in terms of how do communities uh, come together. And one of the things that I have the privilege uh, to do is just to build bridges uh, across all these different communities. And I I think open source is a wonderful way to do that uh, because we're all focused on how do we come together, uh, how do we collaborate together, and how do we build something uh, for a, an overall global good. Uh, and for me, uh, you know, uh, this is a very important thing. Uh, it's very challenging. Uh, my hair used to be black uh, three years ago, uh, and uh, you know, I've seen so many things I never imagined I would have seen. Uh, but it's very important uh, as we come together from an open source standpoint uh, that whether you're looking at uh, you know, big global communities or just the individual participation of people such as myself, how do we start to make sure that open source is available and open for everyone to use? Thank you very much. Thanks, man. Uh, but I, I'm excited about this next topic. Um, you know, we're going to dive back into uh, the conversation around cybersecurity. Uh, and our next speaker is the co-founder and chief executive officer of Horizon 3 AI. Uh, this is a cybersecurity uh, firm pioneering the use of AI in autonomous pen testing. Uh, and if that doesn't scare you enough, he, prior to this role, he was the CTO for the Joint Special Operations Command in the United States. Uh, and today he's going to come and talk to us about building a next generation security ecosystem. Please welcome Snehal Antani. All right. Thanks, uh, thanks everyone, for the time today. Uh, so, my name is Snehal Antani. My background. Uh, software engineer by trade, uh, started my career at IBM, uh, and then was a CIO at GE Capital, and then CTO at Splunk, and then took a break from industry, industry to serve within the US special operations community. Uh, hardest, most meaningful work of my career, and for those uh, that I've caught up with dinner, I've shared some of those stories, which have been fun. And then I left to start uh, Horizon 3 as the founder CEO, uh, where we pioneered the use of AI-enabled pen testing. And I think it's a good follow-on to the previous two sessions that we had here. So what I want to talk about today is first, this realization that as defenders, most of us knew very little or know very little about the actual details of attacks. And to become better uh, defenders, we have to invest that time in understanding how offense can be used to inform defense. The second thing is we pioneered the use of AI-enabled pen testing. I'll tell some stories around uh, how the, the barriers of entry to conduct a high-end cyber attack have been dramatically reduced. And so as you heard from the previous speaker, SOCs are already overwhelmed. Well, AI enables more robust attacks in larger environments faster, and so the situation is only going to get worse. And the third is that we only win through community. And I believe the security ecosystem and community is fundamentally broken today, comprised mostly of Twitter celebrities trying to sell their security courses. And that the Linux Foundation, an organization I've admired for years, is uniquely postured to be the gravity and catalyst to bring that community together and do something significant. So what I'm going to talk about is really my experience as a, on, the, on the buyer, the user side of cybersecurity as a CIO. And the challenge we always had in the seat was, are we secure? And the answer is, I have no idea. I've got to wait for the bad guys to show up. And before that, am I fixing the right vulnerabilities? Am I logging the right data? Are my security tools actually tuned correctly? 
and I literally had to sit around and wait for a breach to find out. And that isn't very sustainable. And I tried to go down the penetration testing route as the only viable way to identify where I was exploitable. But that in itself was an absolute horrid experience in that first I had to go off and justify the budget. The second is we would spend weeks preparing our IT organizations for that pen test to show up. And then they'd show up and absolutely rip us apart. I don't know if it's too soon for this meme, but you know, we'll work it in there. And then this year's results looked exactly like last year's results. And this is incredibly frustrating for me as a CIO and then a CTO within the Department of Defense because I needed to verify my security posture. My commander used to say, don't tell me we're secure, show me. And then show me again tomorrow and then show me again next week because our environment is constantly changing and the enemy always has a vote and is evolving. And so what I went through as a security journey, uh, said both in the financial services sector and in the government, was first assuming breach. There are way too many doors and windows that allow the bad guys to gain initial access. And what was more important was not my perimeter security, but how quickly I could isolate the blast radius upon initial compromise. And that was the shift from talking about being secure, which is a point in time state, to being defensible, the ability to rapidly adapt to minimize the blast radius and stifle the attack and the progression of an attack. The second thing I realized is that Attackers don't hack in using zero days that you see in the movies. Often they're logging in with credentials that they've harvested. And credentials became the primary attack surface I had to get after. And there are no CVEs that represent credentials. There's no open source software bug that represents credentials. Yet this is the single biggest attack surface in most organizations. And the third is that I should be testing as often or more often than I am changing in my environment. And this is a big mental shift towards the ability of testing as frequently as you possibly can. So for every patch Tuesday, you need to have a pen test Wednesday. What we ended up evolving into was this find, fix, verify cycle where I wanted to continuously identify my exploitable attack surface. I wanted to understand how that attack surface evolved over time. I wanted to rapidly fix and remediate issues that truly mattered. And I wanted to verify that my security tools were actually effective. And the faster this cycle, the, the better defensible I am within my organization. So I'm gonna talk about, in the first section here, is uh, talk through four major types of attacks patterns that we've seen across our customer base. So for context, we've run 28,000 pen tests in the last 18 months, uh, and that is more than the top 20 consulting firms combined throughout their entire history. And so what we've got is a lot of visibility into the common vectors for compromise. And when you think about a compromise, attackers uh, are, are very routine and well-defined in what they're trying to achieve. There are a well-known set of waypoints or technical objectives that an attacker gets after. The first is path to becoming a domain administrator, because if they become domain admin, they've got keys to the kingdom. Okay, if they can't get the DA, can they at least compromise a host and then borrow an attack at a later point? or from that host compromise start to harvest credentials and then snowball into a bigger problem. If they can compromise a domain user, they have access to all of the data systems and services of that domain user. And then the initial reaction is, well, what if I have multi-factor authentication turned on? Well, that TV doesn't support MFA, that printer back there doesn't support MFA. MFA can't be applied to lower level protocols in the organization. So you have to really understand what is your attack surface and what parts of your defense in depth are actually effective and not. The next part is, uh, from a testing standpoint, once you've got the technical objective sorted, you want to start to understand very specific operational scenarios. Is your network segmentation actually isolating the blast radius of an attacker? Is it properly stifling lateral movement? If you start down a zero trust project, the first day of that zero trust project, an attacker has complete network reachability because it's a flat network. Over time, though, you should see that reachability change and shrink and condense. And you don't know that until the bad guys have showed up. So how do you verify segmentation or the blast radius of a compromised credential or that your tools are actually working? And then finally, how do you talk about your security posture in the language of the business? Because they don't care about uh, whether you had a container security product in place. What they want to understand is, uh, are you effective in detecting and stifling attacks? Can their uptime be compromised and affect cash flow? Can information be compromised and lead to legal risk? And so on and so forth. And that every time you update an application, onboard a new employee, 
or patch a server, your attack surface has changed. And so every time you do any sort of change in the environment, you've got to go in and verify that you're no longer exploitable. So I'm going to share four stories real quick. The first one is, and these are all real stories of attacks. This is a large bank, 5,000 hosts, uh, so just a small segment of their environment. And this company had uh, the latest EDR and UBA tools in place. And they initiate, assume breach, and initiate a pen test on a single host. And like an attacker, there's a famous Microsoft quote, uh, defenders think in lists, attackers think in graphs. The first thing an attacker is going to do is build out a knowledge graph that represents every host, port, service, credential, and so on within the environment. And within this particular customer, they were using a well-known EDR to protect their host. Yet we were still able, to, still able to get code execution on a Windows box, successfully dump credentials, and then reuse those credentials to become domain administrator. And so the big question from that CIO was, what on earth happened? And it turned out that the EDR was misconfigured on three out of the 5,000 machines. It was just bad automation. And the customer had no idea. And the key point is, you can't trust that your security tools are working. You've got to verify that they're working properly. And this, is, this has occurred with every major EDR that's out there, whether it's CrowdStrike, Trend Micro, uh, or AV products as well, with Trend Micro, Fortinet, and so on. Oftentimes, these EDRs are misconfigured because, say in Trend Micro, there's an advanced checkbox that says prevent OS credential dumping. Most people don't know what that checkbox does, and they don't realize that it has to be enabled to prevent uh, critical types of credential harvesting from occurring. And so these tools are super complicated, so just because you bought it and installed it doesn't mean it's effective. The other part here is the customer asks, well, why didn't the credential pivot get detected and stopped uh, by the EDR tool? Because the marketing brochure says so. And it turned out the customer purchased the wrong module within that particular vendor. And that is not a conversation. Uh, I'm happy I wasn't in that particular room when they talked about you know, what they bought, what they didn't bought, because they got charged for something. And the final part here is uh, you've got to verify. And you're going to hear that over and over again in my, in my uh, talk. The second story is that attackers don't hack in, they log in. So one of the very first steps any attacker does upon gaining initial access is they start listening for NTLM hashes being passed along the wire. So you can turn on a tool called Responder, and there's other variations of that tool. And they'll grab um, NTLM hashes being passed around through multicast configurations for DNS. And when you grab enough of those NTLM hashes, you've got enough to start cracking those hashes. And as you crack those hashes, you get clear text passwords that match up with the user IDs you've collected. And in this example, you can now use that to say, take over um, Office 365 email. Now the first question I always get is, yeah, but I've turned on uh, multi-factor authentication for 365. And what people don't realize is, you might turn that on at the groupler company level, but when a new employee joins the company, they still have to explicitly set up MFA, which is why attackers wait to see job changes in LinkedIn and then they'll target those new employees within the first one to three days of them joining your company because they know they likely haven't set up MFA yet. So what we found consistently and shockingly was that 80% of the NTLM hashes we would collect in a pen test were cracked in 15 minutes or less. And we're not using some crazy quantum infrastructure. These were standard GPU rigs that were able to crack those. In fact, a lot of those passwords were cracked near instantaneously uh, for a variety of reasons. 10% of the service accounts we found had the user ID and password as the same value. WebSphere admin, WebSphere admin, VMware admin, VMware admin, so on and so forth. And then we also found a lot of regional use of passwords. For instance, if you're from New England, it's Tom Brady's the goat. And if you're from Atlanta, it's 28 to 3 WTF. Um, I used that in, in Atlanta a few weeks ago, and I had to run off stage. <laughs> but the point is that attackers don't hack in, they log in. And this is the primary attack vector across the board. The third story is a really interesting one of compromising a hybrid cloud environment to take over the production AWS infrastructure. And in this example, uh, initial access on a single machine, and how many people here use HP ILO or know what HP ILO is? Right? It's a virtual appliance to uh, manage storage devices. HP ILO is a very difficult VM to monitor an instrument because it's a custom OS and people don't patch it, they don't pay much attention to it. But attackers know this. The same thing with Dell iDRAX and other kinds of vendor-specific virtual appliances. So after conducting recon and organizing data into a knowledge graph, we found an HP ILO box um, that was network reachable. And we were able to successfully get code execution on that box. And once again, 
Not a single alert got triggered because most people aren't monitoring and observing these types of components in their network. Well, ILO stores all of its credentials in clear text and memory. So once you get a code execution on that box, we're able to dump those credentials and compromise a domain user and start to access the file shares that that domain user had access to. And from there, pilfer the file share, and we found the key store file that allowed us to log into their production AWS account. This entire attack looked, took less than two hours. Not a single security alert was triggered despite every Gucci tool being owned by this particular customer. And that's because they weren't observing the ILO infrastructure. And then from there, everything else was a valid login. And nothing is gonna get tripped. And what you'll see here is, while there was a CVE used for the HP ILO box, the rest of it was just standard maneuver and it looked like regular traffic. And the final story of four that I'll bring together is how all these pieces are stitched together to be a complete attack. So this is essentially what you saw go down at MGM, at Caesars, and most organizations. And the first thing attackers are going to do is conduct some sort of open source intelligence from the outside. So if you wanna go compromise um, uh, uh, systems on, an, on a United airplane, you're gonna go to LinkedIn Sales Navigator and search the word pilot, search for you know, company United, and you're gonna find there's 7,000 pilots in there. And before I say that, I mean, raise, who, who here uses multi-factor authentication? Raise your hands. All right, great. And be honest on the next question. How many people reuse passwords across machines and systems? Raise your hands, all right. And how many people, be honest, uh, use personal information in their passwords? Raise your hands. You all just failed your security training and awareness. <laughs> all it takes is one person to reuse their co uh, uh, compromised Netflix credentials as part of their corporate email, just one. So if I've got 7,000 pilots, one of them is gonna reuse uh, credentials in a breach database that I'm gonna be able to find as to log into their corporate email. And their corporate email is first initial last name at united.com. So it's through basic open source intelligence, I've now got 7,000 potential user ID password pairs. From there, I'm gonna password spray to compromise a domain user. And then in most situations, the domain user is also the local admin on their laptop which means they can install applications, they can configure stuff, and that's very typical in most large companies. Well, if I'm the local admin, I'm gonna be able to dump SAM, grab those NTLM hashes, of which, as I said, 80% are cracked in 15 minutes or less. I'm going to reuse those credentials to gain access to neighboring machines, and then from there, I'm eventually going to find a, a critical credential, whether it's a domain admin credential, a service account credential, or so on, to compromise the domain and have keys to the kingdom. And there is no magic AI button to prevent this from happening. It's the basics. It's that poor password policies were implemented, or a lapse, local admin privileges weren't properly secured, or that Active Directory was too permissive, and so on. Instead, in now 28,000 pen tests, we talk about AI for defense. User behavior analytics products in 28,000 pen tests never stopped us from compromising an environment. Because these UBA tools and these AI-based defensive tools depend on pristine logging data. So unless you are cloud native by design, observability by design, um, uh, AI based SOC by design up front, it's gonna be very difficult to have the pristine logging data in place for the benchmarking and baselining that these AI algorithms require in order to stifle an attack. Another interesting thing is you can't trust your SOC's response time or your MSSP's response time. It took a very well known MSSP over seven hours to detect and respond to the initiation of a pen test, and their SLA was five minutes. And that's because those MSSPs are also overwhelmed in how they're executing against alerts. And so you can't trust them, you've got to verify their effectiveness and then collaborate with them to improve their detection and response time. And what's amazing here is that, so we pioneered the use of AI-based pen testing. We had a, the son of one of our sales reps, this nine-year-old kid, not a technical person, in four minutes and 12 seconds, successfully compromise a high-end bank that had every Gucci tool you could buy. Four minutes and 12 seconds. Of course, the bank permitted him to do that. Um, last year, it took seven minutes. This year, it took four minutes. Next year, it'll take less than 60 seconds. So think about it for your own security organizations. In less than 60 seconds, can your SOC analyst characterize the alerts, get approval to take some sort of defensive action, and then actually do something to stifle that attacker from becoming domain admin? And the answer is no. Humans are quickly going to become the bottleneck because the future of cyber warfare is algorithms fighting algorithms with humans by exception. 
and things are going to get far worse, I think, than they are going to get better. And this isn't fear mongering, it's just extrapolation of logic here. If I can compromise an environment in 60 seconds and the bad guys are pirating the same tech, we need to very quickly improve the effectiveness on the defensive side in order to have a fighting chance at responding fast enough to stifle those attacks appropriately. Another key part here is these security tools are super complicated. So as you're executing an attack, what you want to understand is, hey, we successfully dumped credentials from vCenter on this IP at this time. Did you detect us? Did you log us? Did you alert on us? Did you stop us? And how do you use that to tune your security tools? In the past two weeks, this is a bit of an eyesore, but I'll walk through the data real quick. In the past two weeks alone, to our AI-based attacks, we dropped 553 implants upon gaining code execution. So that means we were able to compromise a host, and from there we dropped a remote access tool on that host that ran as, as a privileged user. And then from there, 60% of those implants were successful, which means the EDR failed to detect and prevent the implantation. And these were a mix of the top three or four EDRs out there in market. So 60% success rate, which means a 40% effectiveness rate of the best EDRs in the market. Of those, not only did we successfully dump SAM and then dump LSA and then dump LSAS and then get telemetry and persistence, we were able to do that in 30% of, um, of all those implants. So we successfully deleted every, or defeated every aspect of an EDR 30% of the time. And these are the best tools in the market. So why do they fail? It's not because the tools are bad. It's because they're super hard to configure and verify that they're actually working correctly. So this brings me to um, two key points here at the end. The first one is, when you look at the primary ways to compromise an organization, number 10 is CVEs. You know, all the CVEs that we panic about in the news, that's only a small fraction of how attackers successfully compromise. The bulk of them have to do with weaker default credentials, misconfigurations, unpatched services that people aren't paying attention to, like HPILO and Dell IDRAC, IDRAC uh, credential spraying techniques, and so on. It's not vulnerabilities in your software supply chain. It's not exploitable CVEs that are in the news. It's these types of techniques. And this is the fundamental problem. And the problem we have is we need to rethink our community approach to cybersecurity. Because if we want to have a fighting chance against those blitzkrieg style cyber attacks, where in less than 60 seconds we're compromised, community is how we win. And so what I see are two forms of community here. The first is cyber range as a service. When you think about, like, uh, there's a new Cisco XE uh, vulnerability that came out a couple of days ago. The attackers have bootlegged versions of every Cisco product and binary. And the moment a new patch is dropped, they do a binary dip to see what changed from this version to the previous version. And they look at the code change, and they reverse engineer an exploit, and then they go off and weaponize it. Well, ethical hackers live by a different set of rules. They don't have access to every version of that Cisco product. So it takes some days or weeks or nefarious mechanisms in order to get those versions to properly ethically research and build that exploit. And you need that exploit to verify that you've fixed the problem. There is no home for Cyber Range as a service where the first step is that library of various products for the sole purpose of rapidly creating exploits to test and verify remediation. That's a low-hanging fruit item. The second is, there's no collaborative space to do benchmarking and tuning. Think of the WebSphere days when I was at IBM. We had SpecJ App Server and all sorts of benchmarks for WebSphere performance. There is no equivalent of that for security tools to make sure they're tuned correctly and configured correctly. And there's no um, place for common configurations where if you want to be sec uh, security by design, you need a place to actually figure out what the right security by design is. I was speaking to the chief customer officer of a very large virtualization company recently acquired by a very stodgy company in New Jersey, and you can kind of figure out which company I'm talking about. And that commercial, our customer officer said, hey, if my customers can't read our documentation and secure our product, it's their problem, not ours. And I was, I mean, I flipped a chair at the end of that meeting because that's the mentality for some vendors. And we, we want to be secure by design and actually do something meaningful. We need a place for researchers to come together and define those architectural patterns of workloads representative of the environments that they're in, not just the cloud native world, but the entire landscape of hybrid cloud. And then the second here area of minimal effort, maximum impact is around a repository for remediations. So what I mean by that is just, just take the fix action documentation. So in this example, 
Um, misconfigured JMX server led to code execution, which led to a rat being implanted, which led to domain admin. Well, if you want to go fix that, you've got three options. Disable JMX, whitelist a firewall, or uh, configure authentication. This documentation is not housed in any repository, and this is a community asset. This is something that everyone in the community is going to benefit on. So the very simple task of documentation for how to fix problems that is maintained by a community and make sure that it's accurate and truthful and effective just doesn't exist. And this is a unique opportunity for us to start to seize the, op to seize the moment. The next thing here is uh, think of detection engineering and indicators of compromise. These are basically personal Git repos that are out there. There is no place to bring all this together. And it's a big hole in the community. And then the final part is production safe source scripts. Once again, there's no place out there that's bringing these together. They're individual Git repos scattered. And as a community and as a foundation, we have a very unique opportunity to rethink what community means to us in cybersecurity. So I know I'm a minute over, but I'll leave you with one last story. The Japanese armed the Ukrainians uh, earlier this year. And allegedly, the Russians got pissed and they ransomware a small manufacturing company in Tokyo. That manufacturing company supplied all of the cup holders to Toyota Motor Company. It should cause the shutdown of 28 production lines and cause almost $400 million of economic damage because of just-in-time logistics and lean manufacturing. If you pick the right bottleneck in the manufacturing process, everything stops. The flex here is not that the Russians ransomware to a cup holder company. The flex is they knew where to apply the least amount of effort to cause the maximal amount of economic harm below the threshold of war. And that is the, not the future we're living in, that is the present that we're living in. And so there's never been a greater time between the acceleration of attacks through AI and the role of community and economic warfare that we're starting to see in the role of cyber there. If we don't solve this now, we're gonna be in a world of hurt. And so this is the chance, I think, for the foundation to get together and do something of significance and consequence in the security realm. So thank you for your time, I appreciate it. All right, you and I are gonna follow up on this. Um, you know, I tend to avoid Black Hat and RSA, and just halfway through your talk, I was like, I'm depressed again. <laughs> it's just such well, a bump. Black Hat's about Snoop Dogg <laughs> and Train and concerts now. They don't actually talk security. Oh, so maybe I should revisit my <laughs> philosophy here, but I like how you ended on a positive note in terms of like, hey, there is a way we can collectively tackle that, so. Awesome, I'll follow thanks up. man, All right. appreciate it. Thank you. All right, our, uh, our, our next speaker is someone who we all know very well, uh, and he represents uh, hopefully not a uh, extinct form of journalism, but one that will long live on. John Corbett uh, is the editor of uh, Linux Weekly News, uh, and for so many years has done an amazing job of just going deep into an important topic with you know deep technical insights, you know, deep uh, you know communication across the community about everything they need to know to do the great work they do. Uh, so let me welcome to the stage John Corbett and subscribe to Linux Weekly News. Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm John. I am, among other things, the maintainer of the kernel's documentation subsystem as such. Uh, I live very much in the kernel world. I mean, I think we will agree that the kernel is a key part of our whole open source ecosystem. So when we start to see kernel maintainers saying things like, mega maintainer feels like a punishment in this stand, or maintainers are burning out, this should get our attention. We should start wondering, what is going on here? Is this, what can we do about this? So that's what I'm here to talk about, is what is going on and what we can do about it. To get there, I need to first talk just a little bit about what kernel maintainers do so that we can understand what the nature of the problem is. Once upon a time, in the early days, if you had code that you wanted to get into the kernel, you'd package it up into an email and you'd send it to this guy. And he would um, look it over and send you something back sometimes that you may or may not want to see and eventually, if you're lucky, apply it to the kernel. And this worked for a while, but if you look at what the kernel community is doing these days, you see the last year we put out about six releases, the sixth one coming this weekend probably, 
each one being a major release incorporating something like 14, 15,000 changes, each one incorporating the work of about 2,000 developers for a total of about 86,000 changes and about 5,000 developers all contributing to the kernel over the course of a single year. This is not something that a single person can keep up with, even if that person is in the Torvalds, right? And so we ran into scalability problems there. Now, being kernel developers, we kept on doing it that way anyway for a fair while after that. But eventually, we realized that we had to do things a little bit differently. And so the mechanism we came up with was to delegate responsibility to a whole hierarchy of maintainers. So if you are a kernel developer now, and you have some code you want to get into the kernel, you will send it to the maintainer who's responsible for the particular subsystem that you're working with. If you have a documentation patch, you'll probably send it to me. If you have a SCSI driver patch, you go to the SCSI maintainers. If you're dealing with networking, you go to some other people. That maintainer will look it over, review it, perhaps tell you what needs to change to make it suitable for inclusion and so on. Eventually apply it to their own repository, which is separate from the re repository maintained by Linus Torvalds. That maintainer may eventually send things upstream to another maintainer who maintains a larger portion of the kernel, and so on, and things eventually converge still on Linus Torvalds, who will take a whole batch of changes or leave it once it gets to him. But much of the work of the actual selection of, of work to go into the kernel is not done by Linus. It's done by these, all these maintainers who work below him. Now, this is kind of an abstract diagram of how things work. If you look at the way patches actually flow into the mainline repository, you can see how it works in the real world. Now, I have to apologize that the fonts on the next slide are just a little bit hard to read. Um, <laughs> I will zoom up, but I wanted to put this up here just to say, show this is the picture of the hierarchy we actually have in the real world. Each one of those little boxes that you can't actually see is, is one subsystem repository with one or more maintainers managing it, and they're organized into a tree, and they all converge in that box sort of on the lower right there that's Linus, way on the right-hand side of that little diagram. Now, if you look more closely, this is a piece of that diagram. This is the, the networking subsystem, right? That box on the right is the NetNext tree, which is where most of the work flowing in f regarding networking the kernel goes through. The NetNext tree feeds probably 2,000, 3,000 patches into the main line with every kernel development cycle. So a lot of work flows through that tree. There's a lot of boxes converging on it. So in that middle column, the top box is the BPF repository, because all the work for the BPF subsystem still goes through the networking tree. The one below that is for wireless network drivers, and that has a couple of specific driver-specific boxes feeding into it. Each one of these corresponds, once again, to a maintainer who is dealing with a specific part of the kernel and sending patches upstream. So that's how the, the structure works. What the maintainers do to make this structure work falls into several different categories, starting with setting the direction for their subsystem as a whole. Every maintainer has some vision of where their part of the kernel should go, where the technical debt is, what challenges are coming in the future, and so on, and works to ensure that all of the code coming in through that subsystem is consistent with those, those directions. Maintainers, of course, have to review patches and make sure they are suitable for inclusion into the kernel. It's a big part of a maintainer's job. Once they have accepted patches, they have to collect them in repositories, send them up to the main line at the right period of time. Big feature changes have to go during the merge windows, urgent fixes go at other times, and so on. There's a whole process around that. Um, it may surprise you to learn that kernel developers can be opinionated people. Um, so we have some pretty strong disagreements within subsystems. We have people working towards a common goal, but with very different ideas of how to get there. And it's often up to the maintainer to step in and get these people to see a way to move forward that satisfies everybody's needs. It can often be a big part of a maintainer's job, especially in certain subsystems. Patches that go into the main line often are fixing problems, bugs, that need to then be backported into the stable kernel versions that are what we're actually running on most of our systems. Some maintainers participate in this process more than others, but it is another, another big job because thousands of patches have to go be backported into the stable trees and then sent through that separate path. 
Maintainers are the interface to the subsystem for a lot of people besides the developers. So they have to deal with vendors. If you're a maintainer of a driver subsystem, you're probably talking with the manufacturers who are working in making that sort of hardware, right? So that you understand what's coming in terms of products. You're often getting patches from those, those vendors and so on. That's a, a whole set of relationships that a maintainer has to manage. And similarly with users. And users could be somebody whose laptop doesn't work right. But by users, I'm also counting distributors. I'm counting manufacturers who are embedding Linux in their products and so on, counting people running large data centers. These are all users who will talk to maintainers when they have issues that they need resolved in, in a particular subsystem. That, again, is a big part of a maintainer's job. And then late on Friday evening, if the maintainer has time, perhaps they actually do some development within their subsystem, which is how they all started there but often they don't have time to do that anymore. So that's a fair amount to do. Where are the pain points in all of this? And I have to start by saying that certainly some of the pain points that maintainers feel are self-inflicted, starting with the problem of insufficient delegation. This list that I just went through is a lot of stuff for one person to do, but there are a lot of sus subsystems where in fact one person is doing all of this. It would, be help, it would help a lot if they would simply delegate that work out to other people who want to help with that. Some subsystems are very good about that, others less so. It is something that we're working on. We also have process issues within the kernel. Um, we can be quite contentious at times. It can be very hard to get work in. We can be very bureaucratic. It can be sometimes a hard place to work, and it makes life harder for developers and maintainers both. This too, we are consistently working on. We have gotten better. We will continue to do so. But there's a lot more to it than this. Starting with the fact that the demand on maintainers has been growing quite a bit over time. The complexity of the kernel has grown a lot. The original kernel release 30 some years ago was 10,000 lines of code. Now we have individual subsystems with 100,000 or even millions of lines of code in them. Maintainers have to handle a whole lot more than they used to do. We have issues like hardware vulnerabilities, we have scalability problems, we have all these sorts of things that are pressing on maintainers and they have to handle a lot more complexity than they once had to do. We have the issue of new languages and new tools. One thing I want to call out here is the current experiment about the incorporation of the Rust programming language into the kernel development process. Now, I am actually very much in favor of this experiment. I think Rust holds out a lot of promise for a kernel in the future with a whole lot less bugs, a lot less security vulnerabilities, and a kernel that is perhaps more attractive to today's generation of new developers. But Rust is not a simple programming language. It is not all that much like the C language that is used for kernel development. It's a lot to learn. It takes quite a while to get good at Rust. If you are a kernel maintainer and you're going to start receiving submissions written in the Rust language, you have to understand the language at a very deep level to be able to review those patches, to be able to maintain that code going forward, to know that you can fix things in it if you have to do that, and so on. This is a lot to ask of maintainers to, to learn this new language when they're already busy and overwhelmed with the work that they're doing now. So this is gonna be a problem going forward. And as we hopefully adopt other useful tools, this will come around again and again and again, where there's short-term cost that brings us a long-term benefit, but that short-term cost hurts. Our expectations for response to regressions have grown quite a bit. We've always had a rule that you can't break the kernel for users. But we now have a regression tracker, for example, who will nag maintainers. The expected response time for regressions is often measured in a few days. So maintainers have to be always ready to deal with the sorts of problems. I want to call out fuzzers and fuzzing techniques. Fuzzers are testing tools that feed random data or directed random data into a, a new system like the kernel, see what breaks, and then put out a report saying you may have a bug here, you may have a vulnerability here. Testers are incredibly valuable tools. They've helped us to find hundreds if not thousands of bugs and fix them before they affect our users. But fuzzers also generate an awful lot of, of output, many, many reports. We're getting thousands of them. And even if all of these reports were good, somebody has to go through them all. Somebody has to understand them all, figure out which ones matter, and deal with them. And that task, again, falls on the maintainer most of the time. 
Add to this the fact that mo a lot of these reports are not good. A lot of them are duplicated. There is a real incentive currently among people to generate security reports and take credit for having gener found this problem. And so we have a lot of people running fuzzers and cranking out re reports without really verifying that they've found a real problem or helping in any way to solve these problems. And this is overwhelming maintainers with, with all of this, this data coming in. And a related issue is shenanigans with CVE numbers. Again, there is a real incentive among C security researchers or people who want to be known as security researchers to, to, have, to take credit for the assignment of CVE numbers to alleged vulnerabilities. And so you're seeing CVE numbers assigned to things that are not security problems at all. We're seeing CVE numbers assigned to things that have never actually appeared in a released kernel. And every one of these is a problem for a maintainer who has to answer questions from users saying, why hasn't this CVE been addressed? Or they have to try to get a CVE unassigned, which is a painful process, and so on. This is a growing problem throughout the open source community and very much a problem for kernel maintainers. In a world where we have 5,000 people contributing to the kernel every year, Understaffing might seem like a strange thing to c complain about, but still we're hearing complaints because the kernel is big and there's a lot of work there. And so we have maintainers saying, I don't understand why we are understaffed and we are overworked when we're working for companies bringing in hundreds of billions of dollars a year in revenue. There's, there's simply not enough people going around out there to handle all the work that we have to do. And that brings stress on maintainers who have to take up the slack much of the time. And related to that is the problem of employer support. Companies like to hire kernel maintainers. They don't always like to give them time to actually be kernel maintainers. And so a lot of people who are working as kernel maintainers are fitting that work in on the side, outside of the work that they are actually being paid to do. They're not being evaluated for that work. They're not being credited for it. This is not really in my mind, an ethical way of doing things. It's not an inclusive way of doing things. And it's certainly not the way to get good maintenance out there. Maintainers need to actually be doing that work as part of their jobs, but many of them currently are not. This is part of something that I describe as dark areas in the kernel, right, and beyond as well. There are a lot of areas that even in a project where most of the people are paid to work, they're no company feels that it's its problem to support. So documentation, of course, being my, my pet peeve in this area. We have 5,000 people working on the kernel. 90% or more of them are paid to do that work. There is not one person whose job it is to write documentation for the kernel. And our documentation reflects that. Okay. Our, our build system is a thing of astonishing complexity. It's maintained by one person. And nobody else really wants to touch it. Yeah, we, I hope that person stays around. Uh, a lot of core kernel areas, if you look at what had to be done, you know, I know Jim worked on this, to, to get the real-time work supported in the kernel. Despite the fact that this work is shipped by an awful lot of vendors, nobody really felt the need to support that work. All right? Companies famously don't want to support work on their older hardware. They want people working on the new hardware and buying the new hardware, and so on, and maintainers are another thing that is on this list. The companies just, it's not their problem. It's not the immediate problem they're trying to solve when they work on the kernel, and so they don't want to support it. So for the one or two of you who haven't seen this cartoon a thousand times already, um, it's still as relevant now as it was when it first came out. It's a problem throughout the community, and it's a problem here. There are certain things that we just aren't supporting well, and maintainers are part of that. So enough complaining. What can we do about this? Well, I have a few suggestions for, for people here and for the companies that they work for. Starting with, let maintainers do maintenance as part of their job. Evaluate them on, on that. Give them credit for it. Because this is not happening and is what we really need to do if we want to have good maintainership in the kernel. But support maintainers in other ways. And if there's one key point, the point that I would like people to take away more than anything else in this talk, it's patch review. If you are submitting patches to the kernel, you should be reviewing patches submitted to the kernel. Somebody has to do that. And if all you're doing is submitting code, then you're putting a load on the maintainer side of the equation without doing part to help that. We've done a very good job in this community of 
making the point that if you're using open source software, you have to give back to it, you have to support it. What we've done less effectively is make the point that submitting code is not the sum total of that, that we need more. We need to support the process as a whole. And patch review more than anything else. If your developers are not reviewing patches, they need to be. It's good for their own professional development and it's what makes the process work. Okay, we need support for subsystem level development. There's often a lot of stuff that needs to be done for the infrastructure of the subsystem as a whole. Again, that often falls on maintainers. They need help working on that sort of stuff. And we need better tools. I have long claimed that in the kernel community, we have underinvested in tools and development tools to, to help with this. And it has often hurt us. This is the community, after all, that worked without a source code management system for the first 10 years of its existence. All right. Um, and the thing being, of course, when we solve these problems, we often change the world. Look what happens when we did decide to adopt a source code management system, right? That resulted in Git, and that has changed things, all that. This is something that has come around many times. It's gotten better. We've had some good support for testing systems and continuous, continuous integration and so on that we didn't used to have in the past. We've gotten some very good maintainer tools that have come uh, by way of Constantine in particular at the Linux Foundation who has done some really wonderful work and has helped to transform the maintainer role and make it work better than it did. But it's just the beginning. We needed a lot more support for development tools for kernel developers and beyond. To, to help this whole process work better. And we, of course, cannot forget that once we have these tools, they need maintainers too. Just to close here, in part of our work in the Technical Advisory Board, the Linux Foundation, we put together a document this last year that we call the contrib Contribution Maturity Model. It's a way of looking at, at how a company works in the kernel development community rate that company's performance and make suggestions for what companies can do to improve their support for the kernel development community as a whole. It's in the kernel source or it's at the URL that I put there at the bottom. I would encourage everybody to have a look at it. Think about, honestly, where their company stands in the spectrum that we've laid out there and what could be done to move to the higher levels. Yes, if we can all do a little bit better at supporting the maintenance process, then we will have a much better kernel that will last us for the next 30 years and beyond that. Scott McNeely, for all his faults, made the point that open source is free like a puppy is free. All right? And, you know, he was not wrong there. It's really easy to bring a puppy into the house. But if you don't then pay attention to it and train it and so on, you're going to have big messes on the floor and your shoes will be chewed up, right? The same thing will happen with open source software, right? If you don't pay attention to the maintenance of it, you're going to have a mess to deal with in the future. So I would invite us all, as we're talking in the next few days, to think about how can we take better care of this particular puppy and all of the puppies that we have adopted over the years. Thank you. Uh, John, you know, as you were talking, I was looking back at some of the, the team. Uh, Nirov is uh, in here from the Linux Foundation who's working on some of our analytics tools uh, to answer some of the requests that you have. Um, one of the things that we could use maintainers, and we've asked a lot of maintainers to help with this, is help us gather data so that we can convince your employers to give you more time. Let me give you one example. Uh, we're building a tool that can show in a project, what or even a subsystem, what developers are working inside or outside of normal business working hours. And, and the data shows that you're all either vampires or you're doing it outside of your, your work hours because you got so much work to do. If I can go show that to uh, someone who heads an OSPO, a head of engineering at a large company, you might find we can convince them to give you all a little more time. And, and that's just one of many examples based on, well, I, I agree with everything John said. So uh, let's continue the conversation, not just with the kernel community, but with all our project maintainers to, to give that help. So I really appreciate uh, all of your talks, John. 
Uh, our next speaker is uh, from the Apache Software Foundation, uh, someone who I've known for a long time. Uh, recently had uh, a conversation with at our Open Source Foundation Summit in Geneva, and we both agreed that we're getting older, uh, but hopefully wiser. Uh, Dave Nally also works at uh, Amazon Web Services. He's the head of open source strategy and marketing there. Uh, and today he's going to talk to us about uh, topics that are a challenge in open source around policy and security and so forth. Please welcome Dave Nally. So, the first thing I want to tell you today is that open source has won. Over the course of several decades, open source has transformed from something that was primarily people sharing patches via email to solve problems that they all commonly had to become the default development methodology people use for software development today. Perhaps unintentionally, it's also become a market definer. And you know, it's, it's notable that once an open source project reaches a certain critical mass, that proprietary software, regardless of how well funded, cannot compete with it. There's example after example of this. We could talk about the Linux kernel and those proprietary unices are all but a fading memory. We could talk about Kubernetes, which has become the default way in a very short period of time that people manage, schedule, and allocate resources at scale. I always knew that we were winning though. You know, benefit of hindsight here. I knew that open source was ubiquitous. I knew it was everywhere. And then something happened to make me really understand what ubiquity meant in open source. It was log for shell. And I went from understanding that open source was winning in software to open source is winning in refrigerators and phlebotomy machines. Open source truly is everywhere. Of course, not everything is a big named project like Kubernetes or Linux or PyTorch. A lot of what we're actually doing is building small components and libraries that are able to be reused. Synopsys, who makes a software composition analysis tool called Black Duck, said that in their 2023 report that of all of the code bases that they saw, 96% contained open source. I don't know what the 96% number represents to you. To me, my first reaction is, is that Black Duck may have 3% or so of uh, margin for error here because it feels like open source is far more pervasive than just 96%. But buried more deeply in that report was an even more interesting number. And that number was the percentage of code bases as measured by lines of code that represented open source in the code base. And the average code base that they saw contained 75% open source. So 75% of the average code base that you come across is open source. I'm not really here though to talk about the fact that we won, or even how we won. I'm here to talk about a couple of the problems that winning has presented us with. And these are just two, because I have a relatively limited amount of time to talk with you today. But the first is something that really isn't new, but does have a lot of increased activity over the past 12 to 18 months. And it's, something that for many of us, perhaps it's the first time in our lives that people wanna be just like us, or at least like our software. And so they have taken advantage of calling their software 
Are there other technology elements open source? And we heard Brian talk about this a little bit earlier. This is a big problem because it's going to cause problems for our users over the long term. They're not going to understand the freedoms that we expect them to have when we call something open source. We even have folks wanting to take the halo effect that open source software has earned and apply it to brand new technologies like open source AI. I'm still not sure what open source AI might look like. Is that open source data, open source transformers? Are the models themselves open source? I don't know. I'm glad there are people who are working on that actively, but I think it is important for us to hold fast on that definition for no other reason than to benefit the users who make, uh, who make use of the software and other technology that we produce. They should have the same freedoms that we are used to when we are talking about open source software. But the second problem that we have is that the entire world has realized that open source is everywhere. We have governments now who want to regulate us. Some of those are well-intentioned, some of them much less so. And so we're now entering into a phase where open source is doing amazing innovative work, critical work. It is the foundation that we build upon. 75% of the average code base is open source. And we are now having folks who also realize that. And instead of hearing, wow, it's amazing how innovative you are, they're saying, yes, we realize how important you are and we realize we must regulate you. These are new challenges. They're not technology challenges. And I didn't come here to whine about problems that we're facing due to our success. I came to Member Summit to talk about some of the problems that I see because this is where leaders come. Leaders in companies, leaders in open source organizations. I often joke with Jim that Member Summit is the Davos of open source. And so I'm coming here and my plea to you today is as you're going back to your organizations and companies, think about what's going to happen in 2024. How are you going to help open source deal with the sustainability problems that, that John was talking about earlier? How are you going to help us deal with the fact that folks want to overload the definition of what open source is? How are you going to help us deal with the fact that governments are seeking to regulate us in ways that would change the very existence of open source? I don't have solutions for these today, but I know that this particular audience has the capability to work on it. Thank you so much. With, with, what is it? With uh, great power comes great responsibility is the other uh, cliche, and I think uh, your talk is, is well stated, uh, Dave. Uh, our last speaker, we're going to circle back to the topic of AI uh, for uh, and specifically talking about responsible AI. Uh, the speaker has had a decade of service in the Austrian public sector. Uh, Katerina relocated to Silicon Valley and has since focused her career on tech policy, privacy, uh, security, and AI regulation. Uh, please, she's the founder of the AI Education Network. Uh, please welcome to the stage Katerina Kerner. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, it, I'm going to um, address a complex topic, as we have heard. Uh, there are a couple of um, answers, that, uh, questions that have not been answered yet. And this is working. So it is indeed challenging to talk about responsible AI in the context of open source, um, as our starting point is um, this very complex and conceptually difficult relationship between open source and AI. The open source definition, as you all know best, has been super robust um, for decades. And today, with this rapid growth of AI and machine learning, the definition faces new challenges. Um, AI and machine learning involves various components. 
and we have to explore how the open source definition as we know it can adapt or include those new elements. <coughs> then also, of course, as um, you have addressed in, in your talk earlier, the public release of AI ML components such as LLMs um, with Meta's um, leading example of releasing Llama uh, has contributed to this conflation of the term open source, um, sharing the trained model but not sharing the training data or the code used for, the, for training. So, but what is responsible AI? I think it's not, uh, I mean, the term responsible AI, ethically AI, trustworthy AI is um, kind of omnipresent, at least in, in my bubble. But it can sometimes seem as a, still a fluffy term, but actually it's not. It has a pretty clear profile by now. Responsible AI is a set of good governance guidelines that are composed of a set of common principles. These usually include privacy, data governance, accountability, auditability, robustness, security, transparency, <laughs> explainability, fairness, human oversight, and promotion of human values or the alignment issue. And there are many sources for those responsible AI principles, um, but nevertheless, they overlap in, um, in those principles. So we have, for example, the UNESCO has defined them, the Council of Europe, the OECD, the European Commission. We have countless self-regulatory um, guidelines within companies, Microsoft, Facebook, Google, Salesforce. They all have really great and also um, very useful guidelines to download and with playbooks, how to operationalize them. We have the partnership on AI. So we have the, the IEEE, NIST. We have like so many organizations which focus on those principles right now. In this context, um, we also, I also want to mention the upcoming EU AI Act. Um, it's currently in the last um, phase of negotiation and it could be passed early next year and it will take 18 to 24 months to um, get into force. And I, I mentioned the UAI Act because it also evolves or incorporates those responsible AI principles. So there is a kind of an overlap and going in the same direction. And the UAI Act will, as had the GDPR, have extraterritorial effect. So it will be super relevant also for the US. Um, it will, um, it, of course, it aims for, um, to, it aims at are protecting fundamental rights. It will classify AI systems in different risk categories with different uh, requirements. And what we see here, I, I just wonder, you know, my notes, um, how to scroll down. I cannot really scroll down. So, <laughs> so in the UAI Act, in the current version of the European Parliament, because there are currently three draft versions that are negotiated between the European um, institutions, Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> someone scrolled down for me. Um, so it, uh, the European Parliament, luckily enough, introduced the exception for open source um, licenses. So um, the regulation shall not apply to AI components uh, provided under free and open source licenses, except uh, when it's part of a high risk AI system or um, a foundation model. Um, we also see that in this recital, so recital are more like interpretation um, tools for the, for the regulation itself. We see though that they mention that developers shall nevertheless, even though um, AI components might be free and open source, whatever that exactly means is also not super clear yet. So we have the same problem here, maybe uh, incorporated into law if we don't like pay attention that developers also should take care you know, um, of documentation practices such as model cards um, to really pass this information transparency on along the EU, uh, the AI value chain. And also as soon as you charge a price, which you see in the middle, um, except for uh, those exceptions in the middle, you also are not in the open, um, in this exception anymore. And I, um, there is a recording of a um, presentation I gave on the EU AI Act and open source on the OC website. Um, so if you want to learn more about this, you could look up that presentation that I gave last month. Um, of course, um, talking about the intersection of responsible AI and open source, it is super important to note there exist so many open source resources um, 
to do responsible AI better. So we have uh, responsible AI toolkits and frameworks such as uh, IBM Explainability, Model Card Toolkit, Microsoft Responsive AI Toolbox, etc. So I really want to stress that this is again an example how the open source community contributes significantly to also the responsible AI ecosystem and operationalization. But we also have some great uh, projects not only addressing open source for responsible AI, but responsible AI in open source. So I collected some examples. Mozilla has a working group on trustworthy AI. The Linux Foundation addresses open source governance for ethical AI. Um, responsible AI licenses are a big topic in development. And of course, um, Hugging Face has this great expert team working on responsible AI and has a very, very, very good newsletter um, that addresses these topics which I can really recommend signing up. Um, of course, there's still some challenges. So um, some examples of those is governance and accountability. So I mean, Responsible AI is basically all about governance. And while the Linux Foundation does play, um, place a strong emphasis on governance guidelines, we do know, or you know for sure way better than I do, that there are open source initiatives that grapple with governance um, that manifests in various ways. Some projects um, have no form of governance or uh, there others have some form of governance or, or ad hoc governance. Um, anyways, if those governance issues are not addressed, they can have far reaching consequences, including that we have a lack of adherence to responsible AI principles within those very open source communities and downstream. And that could become a problem, I think, if um, this is not addressed, because it could become a bad example and for regulators to maybe look at this closer. Then we have the topic of bias mitigation. Also, I um, can really recommend this specific um, blog post on the Hugging Face uh, website. Um, bias is extremely complex. Um, multifaceted issue with no single one fits all solution. It's not only technological, it's also related to the broader social, cultural, historical context, like who is in the team, who is in the, what's in the data set, it reflects in all of those things. Um, and yeah, so this, um, this blog post I can really recommend because it lists very, very, very concrete tools and approaches and te uh, techniques to address bias throughout the AI life cycle. Among them, this very um, classic by now and um, very successful initiative a couple of years ago uh, of model cards. And I will get to that a little bit later and I have 11 minutes still, okay. And the third topic I wanted to you know, highlight and of course cannot like uh, tackle in depth because this is huge, uh, is uh, also huge in responsible AI is the topic of security. Um, we have a lot of development also in this space, for example, with the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency um, recently released a guidance on how to improve uh, open source software safety. Um, or we have tools like Google's um, Depth, Depth API, which provides free access to the data that, um, that powers the website and can point out dependencies. I just, this is a complex topic. <laughs> it's like, um, I can only scratch the surface and I just want to give some pointers that if you are interested in one or the other aspect that you can, it's maybe easier to you know, have an overview and dive deeper in whatever interests you most. So as we anticipate the EU AI Act, I think it's essential to recognize this responsible AI and upcoming regulations will likely impact all stakeholders in the ecosystem. So it will really be a ripple effect or it will have like a effect as if you throw a stone into the water. So we will do not know yet what exactly it will mean for all of us or for the open source ecosystem or what open uh, source AI will mean and what components are exactly. So it's all very, it's a lot of questions, not so many answers, but I think nevertheless, this regulation will come, responsible AI is totally on the table. So it is really necessary or best um, to strengthen 
best practice in open source AI documentation and also focus on transparency because that can help downstream, for example, by using model cards um, to communicate AI model details and ethical considerations. And I also put together this slide, um, which with some ideas, um, you, uh, it would be great to discuss those because I would really like to uh, um, flesh this out a little bit better even, but what I already um, can list here is, and the recommendations that already came from the other sources I mentioned is to establish and promote a, a AI ethics advisory group or a working group within your project and also um, put together ethical AI deployment guidelines. And usually I talk a lot about AI governance in companies, organizational governance, or uh, ask, you know, I made a study on AI governance in organizations. And I mean, they're all very much at the beginning with AI governance in general. And a recommendation how to start this is usually just start small and just start somehow. So just get together some people who are interested in it, discuss uh, which principles um, are relevant or important for you and for your project and take a concrete example and discussing how those principles would apply to this very, to this project. So this is really the recommendation of all, like, you know, um, the people I talk to in bigger organizations such as IBM, which is great AI governance. And um, I think that's, we shouldn't make it too complicated for, as a, from the start just really get together people. That's also the second uh, aspect here because bias is not only in data sets or in a computational bias, but also uh, it's about diverse contributions. So um, a diverse team is always best to have. And there are also a fairness toolkits that are available for use. Then um, transparency me measures, for example, using monitoring tools or model cards is a big, big uh, topic in responsible AI. Then there is, I came across the tip to um, um, come up with uh, package managers for accountability. So, uh, so pre-deployment uh, that they can uh, really be the, the person who is, uh, knows exactly what is going on and um, make sure that all those aspects were addressed before, um, before uh, get, getting into deployment. And then I came across the idea of curators for open source. So either uh, uh, monetized open source, they will then deploy those tools. I think that's a very good way to go. And uh, last and not least, the various programs to promote responsible AI principles in open source. For example, the Secure Open Source Rewards Program, the Open SSF. And I think um, every, every uh, project where you can come up with um, contributions and um, engagement of the community is great for this um, really important topic. And last and not least in this context, um, I also want, I want to conclude with um, if we need new licenses and how that will look, but we will also have a panel on this tomorrow, so I'm looking forward to discussing that tomorrow. There's the Open and Responsible AI License Initiative that uh, licenses open access usage and sharing of AI artifacts while promoting responsible use. I don't know if this is gonna be picked up, but um, I mean, how much this will grow or not. They make the comparison that open so software licenses apply to code and uh, credit comments to general content and those open real um, licenses should apply to responsible open source AI as well um, to empower the community with, with tools to really be transparent about their initiatives for open and responsible machine learning. I hope we can discuss this further. If you have anything where you want to correct me or um, uh, help me learn more, that would be great because I'm also, I really love to educate others while I'm learning myself. So anything that you will tell me, I can then tell others and uh, that's, that would be wonderful. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. you now we've definitely seen some calls out there for uh, stopping uh, open source in foundation models. Uh, a lot of those arguments ch tend to be very uh, generic and vague. 
someday these models will create a super bio weapon or uh, they'll be used for some nefarious purpose. Uh, I'm not buying it. I think that in order to have uh, transparency, trust, attribution, uh, you have to have uh, open source foundation models so that we can figure out how these things work and build uh, systems like we just heard about.